What's going on, guys? Welcome to All Access Magic. I'm your host, Mr. Ryan Edwards. This guy over here is my co-host, Mr. Blaze Sarah. Welcome, everybody, to the show. How's it going? We've been away for a little bit. It's been a uh, crazy couple weeks for both of us. Uh, yeah. Really busy. I mean, obviously, it's December, so, I mean, it's we're a, magicians. It's, it's, the, it's the craziest month. Yeah, yeah, it's been uh, absolutely swamped. I got a show, actually, very early virtual show. Uh, very early tomorrow morning I got to get up for. So it'll be uh, it'll be a fun night and then a very, yeah. very early morning. But Same. Uh, I also have a very early morning tomorrow. I got to head back into New York and uh, and then I have a show that afternoon. So nice. Two shows nice. tomorrow. I'm excited for tonight, though. This is one that we've been... Uh, We've been going back and forth for a little bit, uh, trying to get this guy on because he is so busy, so like blowing up everywhere, uh, absolutely nuts. Uh, so I, I just want to bring him on. Let's get yes, him started. Let's do it. So, All right. ladies and the gentlemen, show. the man, the myth, the legend, Max, the man, the myth, the legend, Major. Yeah. Welcome to the show. Uh, that's pretty epic. Thanks. What's going on, Max? How are you? Not bad, not bad. How are you? I mean, we gotta we gotta let the cat out of the bag. You already win uh best jacket of Ooh. all time on the show. Who's number two? Uh I don't think anyone else has worn a jacket. The gap between uh, oh. one and two is massive. <laughs> it is yeah. really, uh, oh yeah. no, it's no competition, uh, you know. I mean, we had Elliot Terrell. I think he wore a suit. Uh, yeah. Uh, we had um, uh, your other friend. Uh, Notice that Elliot always talks about fashion all the time. However, he wears the same suit every oh, single he's, time. He's getting called out on the show. <laughs> he's like a Steve Jobs. You know, it's a uniform. Suit. He is. He's every single Steve time Jobs. you see Elliot talking about fashion, he's wearing the same outfit as he was before the last time he talked about fashion. <sighs> I have to bring him on again and, uh, gotta and bring him on. do that. I'm ready for a roast battle on Elliot because he's going to destroy me. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. So, but no, you uh, you absolutely have brought it with the fashion game and the backdrop. Uh, so, <laughs> thank you so Sweet. much. Sweet. That's, what, that's why I said as soon as he came as soon as he came on backstage, I was like, bro, you're killing it. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> killing it. So, um, yeah, All Max, right. uh, how's things? What's what's new? What's exciting in life? Life is exciting. Uh, I guess in the last like three months, I kind of tripled down on content, like recommitted to mm. making videos for the internet. And uh, that's been huge. I think I think it's a really interesting time in social, like short mm. form video is dominating, which is a huge opportunity if you're a magician, because like the kind of content that we create plays really well in, in short form. So, mm. you know, I just kind of felt that happening like six months ago, you know, everyone kind of competing with TikTok and uh, hired a full-time video guy and kind of going all in and having a blast. Like I, I've been living in Vegas for three years and haven't really been making content here. Um, and I like remembered why I moved here, which is it's the <laughs> most mm. fun place in the world to film like man on the street style content. Cause mm, people yeah. are so down. It's like, you know, I used to live in Washington DC and, um, people were really scared of a camera there. Like if you were out on the street filming mm. something, it's like, no, no, I can't be on camera. I'll lose my job. You know, I don't know yeah. if like Jason Bourne or like a spy or something. Oh, especially DC. Yeah, nobody yeah. wants to be on camera over there. <laughs> yeah. Like, are you a lobbyist? <laughs> yeah, and Vegas is the polar opposite. Like people see a camera and they come running like, what are you doing? Because I think everyone is coming to Vegas like hoping to have their Vegas experience. You know, they like get off the plane and they're looking like, you know, what's it going to be? What's going to be my story? You know, and they're like waiting for something to happen. And so it's like, this is this is the moment. So yeah, people are the opposite of scared of the camera here. They're super, super game to just be themselves and be on camera. Cause it's not always about like over the top reactions. It's just about somebody not being self-conscious when there's a camera yeah. there, mm. whatever that means for them, you know? Yeah. That's it. You got to make sure you're not getting like that awkward reaction where someone's like nervous of the camera. It's like to just pretend the camera's not there. Right. Yeah. 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 It's well, interesting to like warm them up first, yeah. like do a few things that you're not planning on sharing. So mm -hmm. I have like one or two things that I do every time with every group to kind of get them excited and loosened up. And after like two or three minutes, they kind of forget the cameras there. And then I do the thing that I went out to, to film and to, to capture nice. uh, once they're already sort of warmed up and loosened up and not concerned about the camera. Um, then I'll slide in the thing that I, I came there to do. 
Mm. That's good. That's good. That's, that's actually good really idea. great yeah. advice. Yeah. For, for people going to film something stuff that's just well. quick is is really you know helpful. Something that's just quick that you do well that gets a good reaction. Yeah. Um, that way, it answers a lot of questions they have in their head, which is like, how long is this going to take? Is this guy any good? Is he selling me something? What's this going to cost? You know, all the questions that people ask in their head when you approach them on the street. It's like that's what that's what you should do after like me anything. Yeah. After the first couple of tricks and you're like, okay, here is the real trick. Now we're going to start filming. That's when you should drop the sales pitch and be like, so for uh, $59. <laughs> <laughs> you can these That'll be yeah. Great. yeah. But that's, that's, that's definitely a good piece of advice. I have like, like Omega you know, from yeah. theory 11 in my jacket. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just like, ready? Red back or blue back. What are you guys into here? Black Black shadow. Shadow. Also Omega, a great effect on theory and a uh, great publication of yours, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, that, that is a great tip is, you know, warm people up before you go straight into that piece of content that you want to get, because then you can make sure that they're the kind of the right kind of people for a camera and like you're not wasting your time and things. Yeah. But also just to get them it. into it. That's the other thing is don't force it. Like I, I have no desire to share something with someone who's not interested. Like I, I'm not, I'm not going to force someone to watch what I'm doing. So yeah. if they say no, they're, they're kind of doing you a favor because you don't, you don't want to start filming mm. with someone who doesn't want to be part of what you're doing. So, yeah. yeah, you know, kind of approach them lighthearted, you know, kind of energy. Hey, what's going on? You know, you guys want to see something cool. You want to learn about your mind. You want to try something interesting. Um, I, I usually won't lead with, you know, hypnosis. Like you guys want to see hypnosis because yeah. that's kind of scaring and threatening for people. So we don't yeah. you know, say the H word when we're out. Uh, usually I'll say something yeah. like you want to see some mind magic or do you want to learn something about your mind or you guys want to see something crazy or you might compliment them like you guys look really fun you want to see something cool um just to kind of like you know start with a fun kind of playful energy and then again do that like quick bit to kind of get their attention and show them okay this guy's for real and then do the mm. thing that you came there to do you know nice. yeah yeah that's yeah. interesting i i remember the <laughs> the last time that i went out and shot content there was definitely one group that i was trying to force it with and yeah. my line when i walked up to him is i was like oh are you guys down for a 10 second TikTok?" and i think i spent 10 minutes with that group yeah and i was like oh i definitely lied to these people and there was yeah there was one person at the end of that that was like i think that was a little bit longer than 10 seconds <laughs> yeah yeah i try not to put a time limit on it i might just say like you know, see something quick or something like that. But I try not to put a time limit on it because yeah. if you're like rolling and they're super fun, you can start jazzing and capturing. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at my content online, you'll see a lot of the same people pop up because if I get a really good group, I'll do like, I don't know, five to 15 minutes for that one group. Um, nice. And then that turns into, you know, four to six reels or yep. TikToks or shorts, you know, with that same person or group. Um, so yeah, if you find a good group, it's, it's definitely smart to do as much as possible for them. Cause like that energy is just, you know, really translates to camera. You know, if you have somebody standing there with a poker face, you know, it's not really fun for the viewer. So yeah. again, the reaction doesn't have to be over the top. They just have to be themselves, whatever that means for them. What do you mean? Chris Angel used to pay people a lot of money to run away from the camera. They're being themselves. Out. What do you yeah. mean? Yeah. <laughs> just being themselves. <laughs> I don't, I don't know anything about that, but yeah. I just try to get I'm people to messing. be comfortable and, and be themselves yeah. and to forget about the camera. And I think you do that by like building rapport with them and showing them something quick up front, kind of getting them buy in and then like allow the group to grow as you, as you're performing. So you mm -hmm. kind of like, don't get tunnel vision with just those three people. Notice the two or three people behind them that are kind of like, not sure. Cause they see a camera and they're not sure if they should interrupt and you can wave them over be like, Oh no, no, come over here. Why don't you guys take a look, join them, that kind of thing. And then you can kind of move from one group to the next. Uh, it's almost like once we get going with one group, like every person who we perform for next sort of self-selects. So it's really about getting started and kind of getting that momentum going. And then people get naturally curious about what you're doing and they start to join. And then you can kind of like dismiss one group and move on to the next and join groups and that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. yeah, momentum is definitely a real thing for sure. Yeah. I mean, Vegas is, again, you said it's already a great place because everybody wants that Vegas experience, but mm. there's constantly conventions and everything else over there as well, which is got to lend yeah. itself to, to thousands. You can do it in any city though. People. I mean, you know, assuming it's not super cold outside, that's the only thing that yeah. goes against you <laughs> yeah. is like the weather is if it's freezing cold, people don't want to stand still and talk to you for five minutes. It's just mm -hmm. the reality. Even now in Vegas, uh, it's like in the thirties and forties at night. So we can't really film at night right now. Because people just don't want to stand still. They're like on their way to the next thing. Yeah. Um, and I like to film outside. So, 
Yeah. Yeah, it was interesting that at the beginning you said uh, that it's a very exciting time for magicians because yes. what we do naturally would work for short form content. Yeah, and I think that that is that's an interesting mentality shift that has happened recently. As, and, not, and I say recently, as in the past like few years, yeah, uh, in social media. But I think that for the longest time there was like this kind of community rejection maybe it was like older members of the community whatever where magicians were like oh you know what i'm doing is meant to be done live i can't i, I hate having to cram it into 60 seconds um or 30 hey. seconds even before when instagram was younger but um but it yeah. seems like by embracing that we're able to then reach a whole other audience it's just a new medium it's not better or worse than anything that's come before i mean it's just it is what it is so you can use the opportunity that's in front of you which is I think this is the greatest opportunity in the history of social media to grow an audience. Like mm -hmm. this to me feels like I joined TikTok in like the end of 2019, like October 2019. And at that moment, it was like peak TikTok. Like you could just put anything out and it would go viral and then good. Uh, and I think I got like a million followers in three months or something mm -hmm. like that. And nice. then it got very crowded because people see that kind of growth and then it, people start competing for attention. And then it, you know, it's a, it's a bigger pool. You're kind of mm -hmm. competing for eyeballs, right? Uh, right now, well, like six months ago, I started to notice that it started to feel like that on other platforms, like mm. YouTube shorts started to feel that way. Facebook is back in a big way with Facebook mm. reels. Like a lot of people don't know that you can actually create a reel on Facebook. So it's not mm. posting a reel to Instagram and then pushing it to your Facebook. That's not the same thing. It's actually going to Facebook and making a reel. It's a native video on Facebook mm. and those are super explosive. And then YouTube shorts is like massive opportunity. And so the place that everyone is competing right now is Instagram and Instagram is like the slowest, slowest growth of all the platforms to get something to go viral because it's where every business wants to be. So if you're, you know, uh, I don't know, Joe Schmo and you have a flower shop on the corner or a coffee shop, you, you have to be on Instagram. Like it's the first thing that, that people do. So it's just naturally, there's a lot of more noise there. You should still be posting on Instagram, but yeah, it's, it, what's also really exciting is like, this is the first time at least as I've been paying attention to social media, that every platform is craving the same exact format of content. And mm -hmm. it, what it used to be is you had to film or edit things differently for Facebook or YouTube or Instagram. It had to be mm -hmm. contextual where you were uploading it. And right now, because everyone is losing to TikTok, it's, it's short form, vertical, full screen video. And so mm -hmm. it's really exciting if you're a creator because you don't have to edit things five different ways. You can put it on you know, Snapchat, Spotlight. You can put it on... Instagram Reels, Facebook Reels, YouTube Shorts, TikTok, and you, if you want to make content, you should be in all those places. But the beautiful mm -hmm. thing is that you you can just create one thing and then you can put it everywhere. And it's, you know, under 60 seconds, you know, start quickly, start right in the action. And if it goes viral on one platform, nine times out of 10, it'll also go viral on all the other platforms. So um, yeah, it's really exciting that you can just have this massive reach with a single piece of content. Now, I had one video like the end of November, that did like 30 million on YouTube, 20 million on Facebook, 15 million on Instagram, mm -hmm. like every every platform, it reached a, a massive audience, which is just kind of kind of mind -bogg boggling that mm -hmm. you can you can do that with a single piece of content now. So, yeah, it's really exciting. Uh, you know, I'm not pushing anyone to do anything they don't enjoy. But if you have had an itch, if there's been a part of you that's been like, hmm, man, I've always really wanted to do this. Th this is a moment in time. Like this is a very specific moment in time. It won't be this way forever, right? The algorithms are going to change. The type of content that's popular on each platform probably won't be perfectly aligned forever. And this is like a window. Um, so if it is something that that calls to you and you were looking for like a nudge, this is your nudge or shove, like to go all in. Because yeah, it's a really unique opportunity for, for creators and especially magicians, because what we do is so unique. You know, it's not a dance video or a joke or a trend that everyone's recreating. You have a unique skill set that you can showcase that's unlike what, what most other creators are doing. So magic tends to do really well um, on all these platforms because it's, it's, you know, it's different. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, it's, um, I find it interesting. That, so I'm talking about algorithms and things are always changing. Is that something that you are like uh, almost every day? Like I know there's, I don't, I don't think things are that... changing at all right now. I think, I think things are, pretty fixed right now as far as what's working. That's why yeah. I was saying this is a unique moment in time. Yeah. It's like everyone. So it used to be about like engagement. So it was comments and likes and shares. 
but it doesn't seem to matter as much about like generating conversation. It's more about retention. So it's like, does the person watch your video from beginning to end? Like what's the average mm -hmm. duration and retention? And that's, that mm -hmm. seems to me, at least feels like with my content, the deciding factor of what goes viral. So it's, it used to mm -hmm. be really easy to hack TikTok by just baiting comments. So you could put like something silly in the background or misspeak with your words on purpose, which I did all these things. And people would like go to town, like commenting on that thing in the background or the thing that you said. Mm. Um, and that would be enough to make a video go viral. But those tricks don't really work anymore. It's actually a more pure experience. It's like eyeballs. Like yeah. does someone stop scrolling? Like think about your behavior as a, as a user on like watch yourself watching TikTok or watch mm. yourself watching Instagram and notice how quick you make decisions. Like it's unbelievable mm. how subconsciously we know whether we want to keep watching or not in like, it's not even a second. It's like a fraction mm. of a second. We look at everything we're seeing and we decide, do I want to keep watching this? And then once I decide to watch it, do I watch it all the way through to the end? And that's what the algorithm's looking for. So I feel like quality really matters now. It's not as much about like baiting people or farming engagement with your friends. It's a really pure kind of experience. Like if you make something great that people watch to the end, it'll go viral. And if they watch it past the end and start to watch it from the beginning again, maybe your average view duration is like 120%. If they're watching more than once, um, then that video is going to be going to be massive. So I don't think it's as much like gaming anymore. It's just make something mm. interesting that people want to watch. So I think that's really exciting. Mm, it's not even about chasing the algorithm. It's just about putting out content within the format that is entertaining yeah. and worthwhile. You, like yeah. you should follow the basic rules, you know, fill mm -hmm. the whole screen vertically. That, that's the basics. Like a lot of people mm -hmm. will post like widescreen videos with black above and below and the algorithm really doesn't like that. So just like mm -hmm. format it the way that they want. And then the other piece of advice is to start immediately. So just start right in the action. Don't introduce yourself. If I'm like, hey, I'm Blaze, what's going on guys? Today we're gonna, I'm just swiping. I'm like, who the mm -hmm. F is, can I cuss? Who the yeah. F is Blaze? Yeah, you can say whatever you want. Like, yeah, dude. Yeah, like who, who's Blaze? Uh, whatever, forget this guy, keep going or explaining who you are. Like just start. So film your whole interaction or whatever it is, and then just like try to remove as much fat as possible. Like and so it like feels to the viewer like you're starting late. It's almost like, whoa, what am I joining? Like what's happening mm. right now? And even yeah. if you're just performing for camera, like not on the street, right? I see a lot of people who um try to have like a stylish intro to what they're doing or explain what they're gonna do before they do it. Just dive right in, meaning like slice out that chunk of intro, whether it's what you're doing with your hands, if you're doing cardistry, just go right into the action um, and then leave out like on screen graphics, logos, outros, intros, that kind of stuff. Like just just pure video right to the point. Um, you know, captions help if you want not to turn this into a social media workshop. But no, this is great. Um, this is all really valuable. I think, I think for magicians, this is like a really huge opportunity. If you want to reach an audience for whatever reason, whether it's like to reach an audience of magicians because you have products you want to put out and sell to magicians like decks of cards or downloads or original effects on penguin or theory or any of these sites like it's a chance right now to to reach an audience really quickly and then if you're a performer if you're someone that wants to get hired to perform at events just remember who your audience is like remember that the person scrolling has no idea who you are like in the past, you used to make content for your followers, but now most of the views on a video that you create will be people who have never heard of you, mm -hmm. right? So when they're scrolling, they, they make a decision really quickly about whether they're gonna keep watching or not. They don't know you already. Um, so there's still a place to have a conversation with your existing followers, like stories or um, whatever you want, but your content is, think of it from the context of someone who's never heard of you. Like, why would they keep watching? You know, And they're probably not a magician. Like it's probably just popped up on their feed. And so, yeah, like what, just, just be really honest with yourself. Like look at your own content and say like, if I was a, I don't know, 19 year old guy, would I keep watching this or would I swipe off or 15 year old or however old you think your audience is just look at your demo. But yeah. And just yeah. be really honest, like, and ask yourself, like, is this thing that I'm creating for my ego or is it for my audience? And what's the value you're providing? Is it entertainment? Is it inspiration? Is it education? Like it should fall into one of those three buckets and you could use combine two of those. Like it could be entertaining information or education. Um, but yeah, just like put yourself in the shoes of someone who's on the algorithm, seeing you for the first time and then ask yourself like what I keep watching. Mm.
This is yeah. all very valuable. We're hitting you with the yeah. gold nugget, man. The golden nugget. The golden nugget <laughs> mic drop. All right. Like the hip hop air horn. <laughs> uh, we had awesome. it, but we abused it. Yeah. <laughs> we had the soundboards. It's just is it early. Too much. Get rid of this. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's the whole show. Yeah. But um. um but so th- there is a question that Fidlin Johnny has that also I was thinking about earlier, and that is um so when you are creating content and putting this amount of time into creating content, is that mm. for a different end outside of the content or is that in and of itself the business? Are you okay. making are you making content for the money or is it to then gain a following to then sell tickets to shows, sell sure. product, et cetera? Yeah, so it can do all those things. Creating content can get people to public shows. It can help you get more business or private events or corporate events. And it can be income in and of itself. Um, so it can check any of those boxes depending on what your intent is and who you're creating content for. Like I know Fiddle and John does a lot of product reviews. So his intended audience is Mm -hmm. other magicians. And so can you reach a larger audience with short form content to bring them to your longer content, Fiddle and John? Absolutely. How do you do that? You take what you created for long form and you turn it into a 30 second mini review and you put that on TikTok, you put that on Instagram. For me personally, I don't, generate my income from social media i earn a living performing at large events like conventions conferences and and private parties and things like that so i've never needed content to make me any money because it all filtered back to awareness like more people knowing what i do Mm -hmm. and you know every time i've had a, a video go like just mega viral on tiktok or instagram we we can see an uptick in in leads like through the website of people calling and wanting to book me um and i've had like billionaires see a video on TikTok and then fly me across the world to do a show for them. Like, it's crazy to mm-hmm. think like some guy is sitting like scrolling and he's like, what's this about? And then they, they hire you. So it, it really does happen. Mm-hmm. Now on the note of like, can content be a good income source, short form content? Because that's what I do. Uh, and the answer is that the tide is actually changing. And that's the other thing that's super exciting is that short form has always been compensated for with a bonus structure. So like the way that I get paid currently from TikTok and Facebook and YouTube and Instagram is uh, what they call like bonuses. And it's not linked to views. It's just like a target they give you and they, they if you hit the target of, I don't know what mine was, 11 million views or something last month, then they give you like a lump sum payout. Um, and anybody can apply for the bonus programs on, on shorts or TikTok or that kind of thing. Um, but what's changing in, in the it's like peanuts. It's nothing compared to like YouTube monetization. Like for mm. uh, three million view video on TikTok, I think it's like a hundred bucks. So that's- yeah, I know with Reels bonus on Instagram, if you hit like the cap of say twelve million or whatever views, I think it's like twelve hundred dollars. Yeah, like so you can get you either can reach. twelve hundred or thirty five thousand. Those mm. are like the two main tiers that I hear my friends falling into. Mm. Um, but again, it's not related to ad revenue. What's changing is that YouTube announced about six months ago that they're doing monetization like split for short form content. And currently Mm. 60% of all views on YouTube are shorts. Like wrap your head around that. Think about how big of a platform YouTube is. The only thing I use YouTube for is watching long form content, like learning things. Mm -hmm. But 60% of the viewership on YouTube right now is shorts. Uh-huh. And none of that like ad revenue is going to creators currently. It's 100% going to YouTube. So it's really exciting. They're doing a 50-50 revenue split with uh, short form creators starting in February 2023. And when that was announced, my instinct was, oh, this is going to create a war. Every platform is going to have to do this now. So TikTok announced Pulse. Uh, Facebook already has ads on Reels. So they already have monetization for Reels on, on Facebook. And then Instagram is probably rolling out they haven't announced it yet, but a form of monetization on shorts. And so what that means is, I don't know what the numbers are going to look like, but they're going to be a lot better than the bonuses, their scraps they're just kind of throwing you now because they're realizing like how important short form creators are because it takes just as much work to put out a short video every day as it does to put out a long video once a week or or, or once, twice a month, something like that. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's really exciting. So I don't know what those numbers are going to look like. I'm really optimistic that it could be a whole new income source for me that, you know, perfect world could could match what I'm doing uh, with my private gigs. So I'm optimistic. Uh, and that's all coming like in 2023. Mm, so nice, very exciting. Yeah. But you don't again, you don't have to get paid. See, something to remember is like a video doesn't have to go viral for it to change your life. Right. It only takes one person to change your life. So if you put out a video 
and 5,000 people watch it, you know, or 500 people watch it, if one of those people is, I don't know, uh, Barack Obama, and he really likes the magic that you do, and he hires you to perform at like some global conference that he's doing, then it doesn't matter that that video didn't reach 20 million people and it didn't get monetized because it only takes, again, that one person to watch it, then hire you for an event. And so I wouldn't mm -hmm. go hung up on uh, views. I would just make content you're proud of and know that over time, it's going to put you in front of people who have never heard of you. And then like the mm -hmm. last note on like, does this translate to gigs? This is a really simple thing, but I ignored this for years is if whatever your goal is, like Fiddle and John asked, you know, get people to go to your YouTube or to get more paid gigs or whatever the, the goal is, make that your primary call to action in your bio. And I, I, had, I never had a link to book me for private events in my social for the last like 10 years. And then about six months ago, I put a link in all of my social bios that said, hire me for your event. And then pointing straight to the page of my website where people can book me. And literally that day, I started getting new leads from social. It, it blew my mind. Mm. What have I been missing out on for the last five or 10 years by not having a call to action in my bio? I, I didn't think it mattered. I figured someone would watch what you were doing and then they would go and find you. But people are mm -hmm. on the internet, so you have to make it really mm. easy. So um, if you're not, whatever your goal is, like if it is to get booked for more shows, to use that example, make that super clear in your bio of all of your profiles and put a link, like make that your one link, your one call to action. I see a lot of people using like link trees, which is cool, but you're, you're, you're not doing as hard of a sell. Like you're giving people mm. options of what to click yeah. and then they have to choose. It's like two clicks instead of one. So just decide at any given moment what the most important action is that a viewer can take and then make that your primary call to action in your bio. And then you can rotate that over time. So you can experiment with it being different things like buy my new deck of cards or hire me for your event. But I, I really believe in like having a single link uh, rather than mm. like a link tree or a list of links because mm. it's just going to, at scale, it's going to get more people to take that primary action that you want. Mm. Nice. <clears throat> it's That's great good advice because like That's you really said, great people online are lazy, right? Mm -hmm. It's how fast, can, I mean, I had someone today, I said, I sent them a link and they were like, Oh, I clicked it and then I had to do something else. And so I'll do it later and stuff. And I was like, it's going to yeah. take you 10 seconds. Like, well, but just to give like one more example of this, like it only takes one viewer to change your life. When I wanted to start doing keynote speeches, like 10, probably 10 or more years ago, I uploaded a free talk. I did like a free speech at a local conference and to record it. Like that was the goal. And then I put that on YouTube as like in my uncut keynote. Uh, I don't, I think it's probably still up. I don't, I don't even know. Um, but it only got like six or 700 views, which is like nothing. Mm. Um, but that started the ball rolling of me getting booked at conferences as a keynote speaker. And like my first like three or four like keynotes I was ever booked for was a result of that video again with only like 700 viewers. So you never know who's watching, um, mm -hmm. your content, but also it's not just about money. You never know who you'll inspire with your story and what you're doing. And like every time I've ever thought about stopping making content, like every time the thought has crossed my mind, like in the past when I was burnt out or whatever, someone would literally send me a message that was like something to the effect of your video brightened my day, or I love seeing your posts, or I was going through a really hard time and your words really touched me. So um, you never know like who's connecting with what you're making and on what level um, as well. It's not just about mm. the money. It's about like the impact that your words can have on the people who watch what you do. That's really, that's, yeah, that really clo hits close down. Yeah, that's another, uh, yeah. another mic drop. Yeah, <laughs> just more, just, yeah, it's all gold nuggets tonight. Yeah. So um, one question that comes to mind is when you were mentioning that this is a really exciting time because all of the different platforms are kind of aligned with this vertical format. Do you, uh, do you find that you need to post say different content on those different platforms or do you just kind of like, for example, let's say you finish They're editing different audiences. Video. They're, yeah. they're different audiences. Like the for you page is not the YouTube shorts algorithm mm -hmm. is not the Instagram explore page, right? Like they're different people and I, I'm not pushing people from one platform to go to another platform. I'm building that audience within that platform. So I'm not mm -hmm. worried if it's, a, I literally put the same video at the same time on every platform. Okay. That was my You're question was, yeah. When you finish day. editing a video, does it just immediately go to all of the platforms individual? Obviously not like I, post I do one manually. and share, you I, do manually do one manually. by one. I do it manually because I want to use the tools native to that platform to make the video a little more contextual. 
So like I'll edit the video on my computer and then I'll airdrop it to my phone and then I'll go into Instagram, I'll go into TikTok and I'll write the caption manually. I'll put the first comment, I'll be the first comment on my own video, like starting a conversation, like what do you guys wanna see next? Or have you ever been hypnotized or whatever it is, you know, kind of seeding the conversation. Um, and then also using like the on-screen text tools, you know, putting a title at the top, you know, that overlays on the screen for like three seconds. That's like mind hacker erases her name, you know, or mm -hmm. mind reader in Las Vegas or whatever it is. Because mm -hmm. I, I know now that SEO is a big part of the social platforms. So like TikTok is encouraging discovery uh, based on like search phrases and the content's evergreen now. It's not like it fades with time. So if you're mm -hmm. doing like how to shuffle a deck of cards like a pro or how to shuffle a deck of cards like a casino or whatever someone would search. It, it recognizes your words in the video. That's the first thing it looks at for SEO. It, represent, it, it recognizes the auto-generated captions. So like the text that comes up, it recognizes the text you put in your own description of the video or caption, and it recognizes the on-screen titles and thumbnail titles. And so each mm. of those things is an opportunity to put in keywords. So mm. I might use street magic or mind reading or hypnosis like in all of those places, like the words coming out of my mouth, the description at the bottom of the video, the on-screen text, uh, and the thumbnail as well. So that's why I go into the individual platforms to upload is so that I can give context to YouTube and I can give context to Facebook and, and that mm. kind of thing by using their native tools because they look at all that stuff. So nice. Yeah. yeah, that's great. There was a couple other questions that came in. Uh, Tigger T said, uh, what, what is a better reaction? The speechless ones or the really excited ones? It doesn't matter. It's about it being genuine. It, it really is. Like I've had videos where the person screams and runs away and that's fun. But then I've had things where people get emotional and they're like really touched. I've had mm -hmm. people stunned in silence. Um, sometimes it's their friends reacting and not them. It's just about it being real. To, that's my formula, at least. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know uh, what works for other people. But for me, it's just about it being real. Like it's look, someone can watch a video and know if what they're seeing is a prearranged or not like people like intuitively we know whether or not these people are actors like unless every person you encounter on the street is like an undiscovered actor like oscar worthy actor then like you can just sense it you can feel it like this person is having this experience for real right now mm -hmm. and so i think that's what makes a good video is like again if we're talking about performing like for strangers on the street versus performing for your webcam um, it's like, it's just about it being real and like me, the viewer sensing that like this really happened this way, like, and it's really hard to fake a genuine interaction. Like if I know someone's name ahead of time and the whole thing's prearranged and they're like my buddy that I paid $20, I, I don't even think people actually do that in videos, but that's what people yeah. in the comments think people do. Mm. Um, you can feel it. Like if, you know, people are still going to comment that, but people who are paying attention can feel it. Like. This is a real interaction. He just met these people. Mm. They are actually freaked out or they're actually speechless because like pretending to meet someone for the first time on camera is really obvious. Like we're not, yeah. again, I'm not an actor, so I'm going to suck at it. And then the people mm. that I'm meeting on the street aren't, they're not like Oscar worthy actors either. So you're going to, you're just yeah. going to feel it. Like it's going to be stiff. It's going to be awkward um, unless that's what you're going for. Cause that's a style of content <laughs> too is which, which I have no, it's all entertainment, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. But mm -hmm. for me, what I like to do is like super organic interactions. But at the same time, like if you just have a story you're trying to tell, it doesn't matter if it's your friend or you're performing. At the same time, you could literally perform for your mom if it wasn't set up. Like if her reaction was genuine or your girlfriend or it doesn't have to be strangers. It just has to be real. Um, and that's just about that person not knowing what's going to happen ahead of time um, and not being self-conscious about the camera. That's why it's easier with strangers sometimes is like family members know you have an audience and they're like, a little stiff and um but i feel like that could be a really cool like tricks on my mom like that's it's super funny it's full, like, full yeah. segue that's, right there yeah man. that's like really charming yeah. like kind of funny uh, uh, yeah i've seen like james samuel or, or one of these kids online they do like tricks for their mom and i actually think mm. it's kind of fun like sitting side yeah. by side um anyways you know talking about negative uh, comments and stuff kimberly had a question uh that said uh, if you have content but are afraid to show it because of negative feedback, uh, what do you do? Uh, did you ever have that where you were like, I'm, I'm not yeah, going like, anymore? Look, um, it's natural to fear like criticism and people can be really mean on the internet. That's like, 
as part of the internet is anonymity and, and people say the craziest shit in comments. Like it's unbelievable, yeah. like some of the things that people say. Mm. But I, I don't personally let it bother me because I know that like a person can't know me or know my character or judge me based on like a 30 second clip on the internet. Like I'm, mm -hmm. I know that I am much more than what can be portrayed in that short amount of time. And also I know that people can just be assholes. Like the trolls on the internet are a real thing. Yeah. So it's just like not taking things personally and like having pure intent helps. Like if you genuinely have the best intent behind what you're doing, whether that's to educate or to entertain or to inspire, like people can feel that. And, and that's how I, like, that's my metric for what I'm doing is like, if I'm being real, if I have pure intent and I know, even if someone is critical of me, I, I know what's inside of my heart and I know what my intent was. And I also know where I'm going, right? Like I, I understand that like, this is a process and that you have to fail in front of people. Like you cannot toil away in your bedroom with a camera for five years and then just show up on the internet. You, you have to publish mm -hmm. along the way because that's how you grow. It's not the act of like talking to a camera, although those reps do really help, but it's the, actually the act of sharing where you, you learn and you get feedback from your audience and you see what resonates with people. Um, but I think it's just about like, yeah, it's just understanding that nobody, I guess to answer Kimmy's question, nobody jumps from beginner straight to expert, no one. Like mm -hmm. no one's ever done that in the history of anything. Like there, it's a progression. And so, you know, just compare yourself to yourself a year ago. Don't compare yourself to anyone else. Just like you're mm -hmm. only competing with yourself, you know, um, and just understanding that like what a stranger on the internet says doesn't mean anything. It's like what you feel in your heart that matters. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Max, you're just dropping them tonight. I don't know. Just, just, yeah. just like, straight <laughs> bars. <laughs> straight every, yeah. bars, son. Uh, now, what is the piece of content that you're most proud of that you have published? Um, I Lately, just everything I've been doing around like street hypnosis, like how mm. quickly I, I've been able to like get into it. Um, mm. Like those interactions that I'm posting are super pure. And I, I feel like it's that's a cool thing for people to see is like that style of like street hypnosis mm. the single piece of content um pr probably like there's a handful of videos i made recently making people forget their name on the street mm. like those some of the like scripting which is maybe the wrong word but like some of the words that i chose to use on camera i feel like were really beautiful like kind of poetic and i i don't plan every word i'm gonna say so like scripting is probably the wrong word but i, I have like beats or notes that i want to hit and then I, I film it over and over again with like different people and it evolves, you know, over the course of an evening, like I find, oh, I said that thing that I said, that was really good. I'm going to say that again. And um, yeah, a couple of um, those videos I thought were like really beautiful looking the way they were shot and really poetic in the words that I used. And I think also like the message and intent behind the videos is really nice. It's like, to me, the meaning of that video is if you can forget something as personal as your name, like what's more personal than your name, then what else can we let go of as human beings? Because it's just mm. an idea, right? A name is just an idea in your head. And so mm. if we can release something as personal as our name, then I think it kind of points to the truth that we can release anything, trauma, regret, fear, anger, um, sadness, like, you know, because I do like, Therapy is the wrong word, but I do one-on-one -on -one sessions with people where I help them analyze their belief systems, release beliefs that don't serve them, install new beliefs, that kind of thing. Um, and I think like while those videos are just fun and entertaining, they're kind of like exhibition, I think they point to a deeper truth, which is that our thoughts create our reality and we get to choose the thoughts that we hold on to and the mm -hmm. ones that we let go of. Um, and I think like someone forgetting their name illustrates that in a really pure way because we all go well i could never forget my own name could i and if i could then what else could i let go of mm -hmm. um, yeah i think that's like that video checked a lot of boxes for me yeah wow nice yeah, yeah. It's, it's deep it's very deep i love it mm. i love it it's a really yeah. cool way of thinking well about it. magic's real that's like <clears throat> something i've come to in the last three years and maybe like i don't know some magicians would laugh at that but i i think it's true like 
magic is real. Like magic in the world is real. I'm not mm -hmm. talking about this. I'm, I'm talking about like magic. Ma magic is real. And like anything that we do points to that. Right. So mm -hmm. uh, a friend of mine named Lucifer, he said to me recently, all magic's real. Your friend is Lucifer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We need to pause because if you're taking advice from him, is, is well, he whispering this advice in your light. ear? Yeah, Lucifer means bringer of light. So mm. has a has a positive connotation. But but he said all magic's real, even the fake kind. And I, I think mm. that's really true, is that what we do points to something that is very real. And you can give people the experience of magic, which then connects them to magic in the world. And especially with hypnosis, um, like the mind is magic. And so giving people a, a first hand like encounter with their own mind, I think opens their world up to like them, the participant to the possibility that this is the nature of reality. Like, wait a minute, if I couldn't move my feet for like three minutes on a video and this guy's like offering me $10,000 and I wanted it with every core of my being and I couldn't take a step, then what does that mean? I don't know that every person goes down this rabbit hole, but but I think some people do. Like you can't have an experience like that and then not question the power of our minds. And our our minds are magic. Like mm -hmm. it really, life is magic. Like it, it really is. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's what that's why a magician is like a recurring archetype throughout all of history, is mm -hmm. because we point to something that's like so a part of our experience of life. You know, is like the experience of awe and of wonder. And I think that's like so core to who we are as human beings, but also magic's real. Well, yeah. I mean, when you're talking about the magician archetype in so many things that you either see it represented as the trickster, you know, like the Loki kind of figure, or you see it as the wise old man, the sage, the, uh, the shaman, the, or what the Jungian term would be like the Cenex, which means like the self is that once you be once you fully actualize yourself then you gain this understanding that is that kind of magical wisdom you know and you can impart that on other people and brighten their days and you know and it's uh it's you know it's really powerful that you're talking about using hypnosis or using just entertainment in general as a way to show people themselves yeah our thoughts create our reality every moment mm. like mm -hmm. every single moment right like if you walk around holding a belief or a set of beliefs that are like, I'm so unlucky, bad things always happen to me. Why is this happening again? Like, what do you think your life is going to look like as you yeah. walk through the day, right? And on the other hand, if you walk around and you think things like, I'm so lucky, I can't believe this is happening again. Good things always happen to me. Well, what is your life going to look like, right? Because like our thoughts and our beliefs are the lens through which we view the world. And yeah, they're also how we make decisions, how we frame relationships, it's 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 everything um that's why i think our minds are magic so why it's, don't we get into your mind <laughs> oh i was about to say it is crazy i'm i'm creating a new show called psychic uh and so i've been diving into the world of psychics and all this mm. stuff uh and so i'm doing my regular show and then adding new pieces in just to kind of test trial them uh and so the other day i was watching a, a medium because so i was like okay i need to research everything about this and it was funny because this medium like i think it was fake um or or fraud but at the, they were doing an interview with him after and he was like you know even if people don't believe this <clears throat> i'm still giving people that almost that magic moment where they feel like uh like a peacefulness at the end of it and mm -hmm. stuff because he's talking about the, you know their dead relatives and there stuff are some and then people in the world that are very perceptive and give really good advice is mm -hmm. that is that a skill set like being sensitive understanding like what's really on someone's mind what's the question they're really asking what's the mm -hmm. thing that they need to hear that that's an actual skill set like yeah, well and that's and that's i think what this person was to yeah. me getting at was they were like you know i'm really good at this they're like i don't see dead people standing beside people or anything and and stuff mm -hmm. and i was like well this is what you're portraying is happening but in the end he's like but i'm giving that person that peacefulness in their life like mm. to just let it go and move on but it was all from perception he's like i just perceive things about people uh and i was like oh okay this is interesting um i only know what i know and i only know the nature of my own reality i don't know what anyone else's 
reality is. So if someone says that they see things or sense energy, or I, I don't know what that's like, this might be outside the scope of this conversation, but I said magic's real because I've experienced it in my life. Like mm. many times in many ways, maybe through experiences that aren't something we talk about on this podcast. Maybe we do. I don't know. <laughs> we can talk about uh, anything. Yeah. Uh, if I don't know. If you've ever done psychedelics that you can have a firsthand experience of the nature of reality. You know, you can mm. feel your connection to everything, to all things. You can create magic in your own life. I'm not encouraging anyone to consume any substances. I'm just saying I've had some experiences myself that were not hallucinations. They weren't ideas in my head. There were real places that I went and had real conversations, like another reality. I, I don't know. Mm. Like, it so defies words and conversation that, uh, like, our language is so limited to explain mm. what an experience like that is like. But, um, yeah, you can have a direct experience of God or of source or of creator or whatever word makes the most sense to you. Mm. And you can ask for things in your life and they will show up and you can ask for guidance and you will get it. You will get anything you ask for in life. And mm. that's why I say magic's real because it is, but you also have to pay attention. Like it's not as simple as like, I want to be rich and then you're rich. It's more about the nature of things, right? Mm. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's the <laughs> rabbit hole we're not going down right now. But. Well, it's interesting. It's, I imagine that there are a lot of people that might go, okay, so you can get anything that you ask for in life. I've been asking for this thing and it's never come to me. Is it more about asking what that you can do to then bring about manifesting you something in your life? You can ask yeah. for a clear sign. If you're on a path and you're like, is this the right path for me? You can just ask. You can just look up at the sky and you can ask and you'll get what you ask for. Mm -hmm. uh, if we want to talk about what some people might call manifesting, that's a word that triggers a lot of people because they're like, you mm -hmm. can't just ask for money, then it shows up. Mm -hmm. I think the way to think about it or to go about if you wanted to practice something like this in your life is asking for the energy of the thing that you want to experience. So it's not the specific details of it. Like I want this car, I want this much money. It's focusing on how you would feel if that thing showed up in your life, whether it's the, the opportunity. And so we're not asking for a specific opportunity. We're just asking for new opportunity. And then we're sitting in the space of like, what would that feel like if this thing showed up in my life and sitting in that and teaching our body what it feels like. Right? We spend all of this energy in our lives investing like in thoughts about the past, right? We invest so much energy thinking about the past and things that happened to us and stories that we tell ourselves and what this person said and what this person did. And we can invest so much energy in the past that for most people, if you take a slice of their past and you pick it up and you set it down in front of the present moment, their future is going to look almost exactly like their past, right? Because again, your thoughts create your reality. Mm. If on the mm -hmm. other hand, you just invest a little bit of that energy focusing on like a future that you want to see exist and what that might feel like. See, the body doesn't know the difference between a real event, like something that's happening right now in 3D in this world that we're in, and an imagined event. So when we think about something that happened in the past, our body experiences all of the same chemical reactions, feelings, emotions, everything as if the event were occurring right now. Mm. So someone did that thing to us 20 years ago. We think about it right now. And to our body, it's happening right now. Our body doesn't mm. know the difference between a real event and an imagined event because everything occurs in our head. Everything is a thought in our mm. mind. When that person is doing something to us in real time, it occurs as a thought in our mind, the same way when you think about the past, right? So if we do the same thing about the future, if we think about a future that we want to see exist and we stay focused on the emotions that we would feel if this unknown future showed up in our life, then we can start to teach the body right now in this moment what it feels like to be successful, to be abundant, to get that opportunity on that TV show or, or whatever it is, right? We can just invest a little bit of energy teaching our body a new way of being instead of investing our energy into the way that we've been for the last 39 years of our life. So... Um, that's what manifestation is. It's not like some magic spell that you cast that the universe throws something in your lap. It's like conditioning your body for a new reality instead of conditioning your body to live the life you've already lived, right? Mm. We invest our energy in the past and that's exactly what our future looks like. So um, that's that's what manifestation is to me. It's mm. not some, well, maybe it is. Uh, I don't fully understand the mechanism, but it's but it, it just from like, if you want to just, make it a logical argument 
It's just about teaching yourself a new way of being. And if you can be in a whole new way, then don't you think your life is going to be more interesting and look differently and good things are going to show up and happen to you? Uh, mm -hmm. If you tell yourself different stories, if we let go of the stories of the past, um, yeah, maybe that's all manifestation is. Mm. I think it's more than that. But at the least, it's like teaching yourself how to live in a whole new way and being free of old patterns and belief systems and uh, mm. simple, but not easy, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> he hits it again. You, you yeah. might set a record. Max. If somebody wanted know. to go might, like yeah. really down this rabbit hole, mm -hmm. I, I would say look up um, Dr. Joe Dispenza. That's a really mm -hmm. good resource for like understanding Joe the connection between your thoughts, your energy, your relationship to the past, and how to create a new future. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be a really cool rabbit hole to go down if you find this interesting. If you think I'm crazy, it's, then no, it, it's you interesting. Be going further. Yeah. It reminds me of a book I read as well. I think I have it here. Um, yeah, stop doing that shit. Uh, Gary John Bishop. Um, but it talked about like, we have all these worldviews and we were talking about worldviews a little bit before, but it was like, mm. we also view how people view us, right? And so mm. like I grew up, <clears throat> I was in a special class because when I was a kid, I couldn't like read and write. I had a learning disability and stuff. And so kids would be like, oh, you're dumb. And then so for so many years, I was like, I'm the dumb kid, right? Mm. And so lived my life as the dumb kid. And then mm. once I was in university and or college, I was like, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm sm smarter than these people. <laughs> these people aren't smarter than me. And then I was just learning how I learned differently than other people and stuff. Yeah. And then I was like, in the end, I was like, I'm smarter than everybody else here. Like all of these people are dumb. They don't see this like they can't they can't visualize things like i can and stuff and so i was like no i and it was so that book was all about changing your mindset of how people view you and mm -hmm. how you view yeah. people and how you view the world and so and they broke it down into like three different sections uh, i finished that book and was like i'm changing my life <laughs> like mm -hmm. i don't need to view myself this yeah. way anymore and so it's crazy so i'm looking at the mm -hmm. chat right now and fiddlin johnny says um he's a therapist himself and he says the only thing that holds us back is our own thinking it's so true we were the fighting for that one there. Yeah. the only thing standing in your way is you that's yeah. it mm -hmm. there's nothing there's no obstacles it's not a lack of resources you're not unlucky the only thing standing in your way is you you're the mm -hmm. problem yeah mm -hmm. always it always comes back to you your belief systems your actions um it is funny though because yeah. uh, back in the day I worked a regular like job and I would tell my boss at that time, I was like, we got it. We got to do this. We got it. This is what we need to do. Like, this mm. is the vision for the future. And there was always, always an excuse. Oh, we don't have the budget. Oh, we don't have the manpower. We don't have this. We don't. And I'd be, I'm like, no, you're the problem. <laughs> I'm like, you're the one putting these barricades up everywhere. And we do it all the time. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we're always like, oh, I don't have time for that. Or uh, I'm not good at that. Or, uh, you know, and like you said before, no one hopped on the Internet and was just good at the Internet. Right. It was at like, anything. Yeah. At, at anything. No one skips from beginner straight to pro. At yeah. anything. Some people progress faster than others because mm -hmm. of either the work they put in or their innate talent. Right. They have a knack for it. They have a good ear for music. Right. Or a combination of both. But. Yeah, there's there's no it's something I remind myself of all the time, but there's also no competition. Like you're not, the internet's a really big place, number one, but also like no one else is going to prevent you from succeeding. Like mm -hmm. there is no such thing as competition. I, I really believe that. Like the only mm -hmm. person you're competing with is you. That's it. It's who you were yesterday, who you were last year, uh, and who you are in every moment. You get to decide who you are today. It doesn't matter how you behaved yesterday. Right. Yeah. You can just wake up and have a whole new way of being today. Mm -hmm. um, but so much of like our life puts ideas in our heads that limit our thinking. Right. There's a concept of like what some people call limiting beliefs. Like we have experiences when we're children. Like you said, you held a belief that was something like I'm not as smart as other kids or I'm or I'm dumb. Something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. It's probably through an experience you had as a child, things that other people said to you, that kind of thing. Right. And then this idea gets in our head. But the thing about limiting beliefs is they all start with a positive intent. So can we try an exercise, Ryan, like just for a second? Yeah. 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 
Can you think of, just to turn this thing on its head, like for a second, this belief that you held for shorthand, we'll just use the words, uh, I'm not as smart as other people, okay? Can, can you think of some of the ways that actually that helped you in life? Like what are some of the ways that it, that either like it drove you or motivated you or protected you? Like holding a belief like I'm not smart enough. How did that affect your behavior in a positive way? Oh, that's a good question. I'm gonna, that's just one I got to think on. I, th um, I could think of a way for you after working on your script with you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Would yeah, you say yeah. that it maybe it made you work a little bit harder? Yeah, yeah, 100%. It made you work to try to learn in different ways, <clears throat> taught you to be creative. Yeah, no, 100%. I think, right? Yeah. Like, so you can see how in like subtle ways, holding a belief like I'm not good enough would actually drive you to work harder. Uh, a lot of really successful people, billionaires, millionaires, hold a belief like I'm not worthy or I'm not good enough. And it's so mm -hmm. counterintuitive. It's like, how could someone who's so successful hold a belief that's that self-defeating? And it's because that belief has actually charged and fueled them through their mm -hmm. life. But the problem with all of these limiting beliefs is that they serve us up until a point. So like when we're a kid, they motivate us, right? But then they run like programs in the background for the rest of our lives. And if we don't stop to think about this or have a conversation like this, then they just keep running in the background. And while they served us in the past, we've gotten to a point now where it probably doesn't serve us anymore. So for example, that belief that it sounds like you might have already let go of from that book that you read, but if you hadn't, you could recognize all the ways that it made you stronger and you could let go of the idea you could release it and you could hang on to all the strengths because that's who you are now right like mm -hmm. through all the experiences you had as an adult as a child like no one can take your creativity away from you no one can take your drive away from you that you earn that right but we can let go of that idea that doesn't serve us anymore and we can replace it with a new set of beliefs so um maybe we're veering off the topic of of magic but i think like this is what i'm saying when i'm saying magic is real and the mind is magic is that we can literally go to the control room of our mind and choose a whole new outlook and a whole new way mm. of being. And we can free ourselves from the past. And I think that that's one of the really beautiful things that mentalism and hypnosis can point to is like the nature of reality and our relationship to our thoughts. And so while what you might be seeing in a performance is a trick in some instances, it points to something that's very true. And mm. that is that our thoughts are malleable and that our thoughts create our reality, and that the mind doesn't really differentiate between its own idea or your own idea or an idea someone else gives you, right? So if mm -hmm. it's a thing somebody said to you that makes you hold a belief like, I'm not smart enough, that holds the same weight in your mind as, as sometimes more weight than something you tell yourself. Um, I, I was just about to say, sometimes I would feel like it's even more so, uh, mm -hmm. especially if it's coming from people either that you look especially up to or young, that you know, right? You know? Yeah, you look to adults and people of authority. So mm -hmm. um, all that to say, you get to decide in every moment who you are. And uh, I think that's pretty exciting. Mm. Absolutely. Um, so I think we're going to end right there. We're going to sell this as the master said class. We have to... <laughs> uh, we're going to do the rest. We'll just film the rest. Uh, uh, exactly. Yeah. Here. We're going to uh, just have a private yeah. therapy session with yeah. Max yeah. after this. <laughs> um, we have a lot to learn. <laughs> um, but uh, you mentioned that uh, you've closed your statement about that this allows you to find out more about yourself and i think that this is a good time for us to find out some more about you so are you ready are you ready i'm ready are you ready are you ready, are you ready? All right. now and it's that time <laughs> ladies and gentlemen it's that time it's time for 20 questions it's time for 20 questions yeah it's time for 20 questions it's time for 20 questions yeah Put two minutes on the clock. Put two minutes on the clock. Put two minutes on the clock. Get two minutes on the clock. Here we go. Wow. I'm ready. Let's go. Are you ready? All right. So, Max, we're going to go Here back go. and forth. Rapid fire questions. Most honest answers that you can. Okay. Uh, That's all I know how to do. Get, we're going to try to get through uh, all 20 questions in two minutes. Ready. All right. All right. So, two minutes on the clock in eight, seven, six, five. Dream vacation destination. Uh, Egypt with my brother. Biggest pet peeve. Uh, I don't think I have any. I try not to get frustrated by other people's actions and ways of being. So maybe my pet peeve is uh, being too hard on myself. 
Uh, biggest mistake during a performance? Uh, I don't know. I perform with my fly down a lot. I try to stop doing that, but it happens on occasion. I Someone will tell me after the show. It's happened during the show. Yeah. What always makes you laugh? Um, TikTok, for sure. Uh, I consume a lot of content, both like mindlessly for entertainment, but also to like research stuff. So TikTok makes me laugh. Ridiculous skits make me laugh. What's your secret talent? My secret talent is... Um, one I don't talk a lot about online is helping people change their thoughts and their belief systems. First time you ever saw a magic trick. Oh, uh, well, my fondest memory of magic is is going to the strip with my grandparents when I was 15. That was like the probably the earliest, most formative. Saw Lance Burton. Um, it's the main magic show I remember, the Monte Carlo. That was the most formative, earliest magic memory. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Um freeing people from their minds dream performance venue dream performance venue uh radio city music hall because my season of agt didn't go there it was like mm -hmm. all in a studio so yeah i'd say like radio city most cherished memory um <laughs> pro probably like when i was a kid my mom took me to denny and lee magic studio in Baltimore, which was like the most amazing magic shop ever. And uh, sat there in the car while I went to like a lecture that night. Yeah, she, it was so, so amazing of her. Favorite food? Uh, pizza. All right, so that we dropped out at 10 of <laughs> 20. Ten of 20. So ah! you, although you climbed the jacket leaderboards. I'm we... the lowest on the 20 questions. I You're the lowest on the 20 questions. I get too uh, excited. I want to yeah. elaborate. I don't know how to give short answers. I... <laughs> I'm, I'm working on it. I'll do I'm better. Say today, let's go through them. Let's go through the other ones anyways. Because, Mags, we do want to get to know okay, you Okay, I'll be better. quick. Uh, favorite One word movie. answers. I'll do it. Favorite movie? Uh, Silent of the Lambs is up there. Hmm. What's the worst job you ever had? Uh, I only had one job ever. And that was like being an intern in the entrepreneurship office in my college. And I quit on the first day. Because I was well, like, oh, was this is what it's like to work for other people. So it, it didn't work for me. Mm -hmm. uh, favorite magician? Um, I think it's Blaine right now. He's still the GOAT. Mm -hmm. If you won the lottery, what's the first thing you'd buy? What's the first thing I would buy? Um, <laughs> more toys for my dog. <laughs> That's what came to my head. <laughs> Uh, what's your most highly recommended magic product or book? Magic product or book? Oh, boy. Uh, Bulletproof by Andy Nyman came to mind. That's like epic. Uh, and then David, anything by David Berglis. Um, yeah. Uh, if you could remake any movie and star in it, what would it be? Oh, my gosh. I don't. <laughs> Am I going to sound crazy if I say American Psycho? But yeah, I'm like, <laughs> Patrick fans. Bateman. Yeah. yeah, I could. I would. I'd My girlfriend Patrick. wanted me to be Patrick Bateman for Halloween this year. Yeah, in the raincoat. <laughs> Here, this is an interesting question for you. Would you rather feel like a potato or look like a potato? Look, <laughs> After our deep look, talk look right like there. a potato because yeah. I think like energy is everything. So I'd mm -hmm. want to feel amazing, but look like a potato. Mm -hmm. If you had one wish, what would you wish for? I would wish for like everyone to be free of their past, not to forget their past because that's not helpful, but to mm -hmm. be free of it. Mm. Uh, mm. Favorite toy growing up. Mm. Favorite toy going up, growing up, like a dirt bike or a four wheeler. We did like a lot of outdoor mm -hmm. stuff. So nice. yeah, like, yeah, four wheeler was probably the favorite activity. Favorite sports team. Uh, I'll say Baltimore Ravens. Mm. Nice. That's a great football team. Nice. We had an answer. That is great yeah. to hear. Oh, many, magicians, many magicians <laughs> have a very tough time on that stumper right there. Yeah. <laughs> it's my favorite question, but but a lot of magicians hate it. <laughs> Somebody said books or audio books in the chat, Tigger. Yeah. Uh, both. And release the stigma that audio books are not books. Whatever way that you learn is the best way for you. So. I go back and forth depending on the book. Sometimes I get the real book, can't get into it, and then I get the audio book and love it. So mm -hmm. either way. 
Is uh, um, is that Doctor uh, Doctor Joe? Uh, what was his name again? Sorry, Doctor uh, Joe Dispenza. Yeah, Doctor Joe Dispenza. Is his stuff available also in audiobook? If you just look up any mm-hmm. podcast with him, that's like the best way in to his mm-hmm. world is just to watch like a two hour podcast. He's pretty good on Lewis Howes. Um, but any any yep. like hour and a half, two hour interview with Dispenza on a podcast will be enough for you to know if you resonate with his ideas. And then if you do, then go down the rabbit hole on like any of his books. Becoming mm. Supernatural is a really good one. You Are the Placebo is another one. Nice. nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another audiobook recommendation because uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we're we both really big on audiobooks, Ryan and I. Um, I'm current, talking about Mind Over Matter. I'm currently listening to David Goggins. Never new, Finished. Never Finished. Yeah. <laughs> currently listening to Never it's Finished. It's so good. Oh, it's so good, yeah. right? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, so good. Uh, and that's definitely, you know, right in the same vein of that. You can absolutely shape your reality with your mind. I think he talks about the mental lab. And mm-hmm. that's like the place he goes to, to uh, you know, like change who he is. But you can, yeah, I call it the control room. You can go to the control room in your mind and you can decide to have a whole new way of being. Mm-hmm. Like, pretty cool. Yeah, Goggins, yeah, Goggins is, is a nut. And he's yeah, crazy some people way. criticize him for being like so hardcore, but he said something great in the audio book, which was... Um, we need doctors and we need lawyers, but we also need savages. We need mm-hmm. people to point to, to show you what's possible uh, mm-hmm. when it comes to like, discipline great. and hard work. And I think that's like really important to have an example of like that in culture. In mm-hmm. culture. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and my recommendation for the week, uh, I started listening to Spy the Lie uh, once again. Uh, yeah. By Philip Houston. Uh uh, it's great. It's, it just talks about when, how to spot when people are lying to you. Uh, and so oh, that's really uh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. And so just re listening to it because uh, there's things that you pick up every single time that you listen to it. So, uh, yeah. So if you're interested in audiobooks like we are, then uh, you can go get some free audiobooks and get started. You can see the link right below audibletrial.com slash magic. Help support the show. It doesn't cost you anything and you get to uh, grow your brain. Your and, brain. Uh, expand your mind and listen to some of these incredible audiobooks. So yeah, I'm going to be actually checking out some of Joe Dispenza's work and checking out one of his audiobooks right after I finish mm-hmm. the Goggins one. So nice, nice. Uh, it, it, don't you love how our commenters give us a segue straight into our ad read? It's yeah, really, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they literally have it set up every week. They're incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. um, um, and we, we have some really amazing supporters. I actually, uh, there was someone that I met this past week. I saw uh, John uh, Graham's lecture at Tannins, which was oh, nice. incredible. And uh, and there was a, a magician there who was from Shanghai. And he was telling me, he walked up to me. And it was so funny because I was talking to John Lovick there, like Handsome Jack. And he asked John, Lug- John Lovick if he could take a picture of me with him. And he was like, I listened to every single episode of All Access Magic. So that was oh, amazing. Cool. That's See, amazing. Uh, yeah. Thank you, everybody, uh, for supporting us from all over. And Tigger T, just for this comment, thanks so much. <laughs> um, that's brain awesome. Growth. <laughs> okay, so maybe not brain growth. However, comma, you can free yourself of your mind mm-hmm. by filling it up with uh, with better uh, better ideas, you know, and get yourself out of the rut of believing that you're limited. Well, so we talk about it constantly, like with Audible, we talk about it constantly that like most of the time when you're in your car, you throw on music or you're just driving with nothing on, but it's like a total waste of your life, really. Like you're not gaining anything. And so audiobooks helps you learn stuff while you drive. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, obviously there's times when you just need to like meditate and like, you know, do your thing, but, uh, but it's great. That's uh, I love listening to it in the car. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Big fan. Big fan. So uh, now that we've gotten that out of the way, we've gotten to know a little bit about you. Uh, I'm curious about some of your uh, your past experiences. You mentioned it a little bit briefly. I have a question. Do you find as a mentalist, as a hypnotist, that you are able to get more oxygen to your brain if you can uh, feel the air between your toes? What meaning being barefoot? <laughs> yes, <laughs> my dirty feet, my famous. So dirty feet. I have a question. So where did the uh, bear, performing barefoot uh, start, and how did this become kind of part of your iconography? Kaylin Morelli, that's where it started. Uh, 
<laughs> Kaylin and I did a 30 day creative retreat. I don't remember when, like 2015, if I had to guess, like we went to my beach house in Maryland and we're just like, let's just do creative stuff. And I was just barefoot all the time, like everywhere. I That's how I live my life. Like I just am always barefoot, walking around outside, whatever, taking the dog for a walk, going to the store down the street at the beach. Right. And he was like, why don't you perform barefoot on stage? And I was like, what? Like, it never occurred to me that I could do that, like take part of like who I am in my regular life and, and do it on stage. Mm. And at first I was like, no, I couldn't do that. And then I was like, wait, why not? And then the more I thought about it, I was like, how perfect for for a, for a mentalist. So it's mm. just how I prefer to experience the world is barefoot. Mm. And Kaylin gave me the just beautiful insight to do that on stage. And uh, mm. that was one of the many pieces of great advice he's ever given me. Mm. Yeah. So what percentage of your life are you are you barefoot? Are you also barefoot like when you're walking the streets of Vegas or do you put on some? So I, I, I wear barefoot shoes, which are just like yeah, the good. minimum amount of fabric possible to call it a shoe. It's just mm -hmm. like a piece of rubber or barefoot sandals, um, you know, in situations like that, because a lot of places will give you a hard time about walking in the store or this or that. Or, yeah, I try to work out at the gym barefoot and I get yelled at all the time. But, in, you know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> don't, please don't do your leg press. You're sweating all over the equipment. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't you know. got shoes on, so you're protected yeah. from my sweat. Yeah. So, that is, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Funny. It's not anybody else. <laughs> they, don't, they don't like to hear logic. In That's a funny way. Of looking like, at unless he starts a barefoot movement, then we've got a serious problem. There, There is like a card you can hold in your wallet that gives you barefoot rights. It's like an actual thing. There's a barefoot in society, like movement, people who like, and it'll be like, you know, my religious observation or whatever it is. I don't remember the justification they have for it, but it's all 50 states. It has like the law that allows you to go barefoot in stores. I just prefer to not like be in arguments all the time mm -hmm. in my life. You yeah. know, I just want to like walk sense. in the store and get something and leave. Yeah. So from a practical standpoint, I just wear barefoot sandals. It's easy. Thing. I mean, you have some supporters on this show. I mean, to me, to me <laughs> says no one should justify why they are barefoot. It feels yeah. good. Uh, uh, yeah. Grant, uh, Garvin says, uh, I Sophia love Vergara was so trails barefoot. bent out of shape about my bare feet on AGT. Mm -hmm. It was like every time I walked on stage, like I don't know, the fourth or fifth round or whatever, she was like, you're barefoot. And I was like, yeah, I was barefoot three performances ago too. Are we still... <laughs> I was yeah, going to say, I know how he brought it up a couple times as well. Go. Some people are so triggered by feet. I don't know what oh, yeah. it is, but she certainly was like super triggered by my my feet, which is kind of funny. <laughs> it was interesting. So I, I mean, Ryan and I were at talking about it and we were wondering, is it, was it something that was like the wardrobe department of AGT was like, oh, this. No, no, they pushed that. Really they didn't cool want me to do it. Hard. They were like, they wanted me to wear shoes. And I was like, I don't want to wear shoes on stage. So I had to wear Crocs back like in the wings because you like the union law, or I don't know who governs what you can do on set, but like the rule was you had to have shoes on like anywhere on set unless mm -hmm. you were actively performing. So in all of my dress rehearsals, I was wearing Crocs. <laughs> <laughs> they gave me like a pair of Crocs I had to wear. And then it was only right before we went live. I literally, there was a guy that came on stage and took my Crocs. And then they, it was like, we're live. <laughs> <laughs> That's wow. Funny. That's yeah, funny. it was so funny. fascinating. Wow. Um, yeah. As soon as you're off stage, like put your Crocs back on. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. No, as soon as it was over, <laughs> yeah. they're waiting at in the wings, like when you walk off, and mm -hmm. they're like, hand you hand me the Crocs back. Yeah. But there's like acrobats. Someone's new there, job but... was like Croc manager. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there was a, a lot of acrobats and things like that, and they're dancers. They're always barefoot, but they had the same thing. There's like the guy that hands you the Crocs at the. It's mm. pretty funny. That's that's one guy's whole job. What do you do for AGT? I'm the I'm the Crocs guy. Yeah, I'm the Crocs yeah. That's guy. also interesting. I didn't even think about that. Is on the same show there would be so many acrobats and things all barefoot. Yeah, and there, it's, is it just because you're wearing more clothes than them? I don't know. It's, it's like why is yeah. it? It's so normal in other professions to be barefoot, like jugglers, mm -hmm. dancers. But I, I don't know. People just lose it. Uh, and then for a while, I like the only place I didn't do barefoot was corporate events because I was like, no, you can't. So we tell ourselves stories like we make up reasons like totally in our own head about why we can or can't do something. And it's like, oh, no, I have to wear shoes at a corporate event this for like a year after AGT. I was like, I hadn't given myself permission to do that on stage at corporate events. And I was like, they hired you. They want mm -hmm. you. You know what I mean? 
Mm. Um, yeah, so you don't have to wear a suit and a tie. You can if you want to, but you can wear a big fluffy fur coat and if you want. It, there's no rules. I love so, it. I love it. Yeah. You just have the AC pumping. You're in Vegas, so I mean, pumping in the house. It's got the got the fur coat on. It's great. <laughs> uh, maybe a couple other people coming in. Uh, yeah, see. they're worried about the bacteria and skin contact. I, I don't know. I think we're in like too sterile of a society to begin with. So it's yeah. um, rub a little dirt on your hands once in a while. <laughs> That, that's so funny. So I grew up in a very small town, like basically the country. Uh, and like we have my my college roommate uh, was a farmer. And so we'd have like unpasteurized milk and he'd bring it back. Raw milk is an actual superfood. <laughs> yeah. It's he would... like regulated in some states. You can't get it in Nevada. I have to get it from California. Like every time I go, I bring it back or friends bring it. But uh, raw milk is an actual superfood. Like, mm -hmm. it'll, yeah, amazing. Tastes yeah good, but... well, so we went to guatemala to to do some work over there and uh they you know they tell you oh don't eat anything like unless the place where we're at makes it and stuff and so we went out to a soccer game and my buddy's eating everything i'm like mm. bro you you drink unpasteurized milk your stomach is absolutely fine <laughs> like and he never got sick nothing happened mm -hmm. so uh, it, I think, it, like you said, the world is so sterile. Or even even when I was in Mexico, I got really, uh, I don't know, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is. I got I got pretty sloshed one night. Montezuma's I guess there we go. Yeah, uh, but no, I was drinking out of the tap in the oh, bathroom wow. because I nice. threw up really bad. Uh, mm. Don't remember that night too well, but I was drinking, and my buddy came in the bathroom and was like, "You can't drink that water." nothing ever happened to me so not yet. you were not already sick place. you were already throwing us <laughs> so not, not nothing no. nothing disclosed no. Show. Yeah, <laughs> not, nothing happened yeah. uh but uh yeah yeah but yeah that's the thing i mean it's like that's what our immune system is for is you know you expose yourself to these different types of bacteria and then you're able to develop you know, a bit of a kind of cohabitation with it, you know, and you can that have a certain level theory. of immunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. 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 I mean, this is the whole point of your gut microbiome. Yeah. If you're going to just never eat something, I mean, that's what happens with a lot of people that tend to go on, you know, very restrictive diets is that they end up with hypersensitivities to things that they've ne not exposed themselves to in a long time. You know, if you're mm -hmm. constantly exposing yourself to it, magic podcast, unless you're talking about the gut microbiome, Oh, yeah. dude, we, oh, it's yeah. not a magic podcast. Even, is it even Name. a magic podcast? If you're... This, is, this is all access. Bro. This is all oh, access, dude. The okay, if we're being real, I fixed my gut about a month ago, and it changed my life. It's like mm -hmm. the one area of my health that I overlooked for so long. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, that's not that big of a deal. And it, it like my energy's through the roof. I, just, I mean, I guess it matters. If you can yep. digest your food properly, that's like helpful. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I like optimized every other area of my life except that. For what did you do to fix your gut? Uh, I got one of those at home tests you could like mail in and then mm -hmm. it measures everything about your, you know, your gut. And yeah. then they give you recommendations. Yeah. Based off of that. Nice. Well, it's funny because we have both had very bad gut issues. Uh, uh, Blaze has Crohn's. Uh, I was supposed to have Crohn's for mm. like years and then somehow it doesn't bother me anymore. Uh, so yeah. yeah. But uh, it's gut health. It's gut health. Yeah, but gut health. here's yeah. actually here's something because me and Blaze were talking about this today. Uh, Blaze has lost some weight apparently from not working out, from being busy doing shows and stuff. And I became a dad a few months ago, and so I have gained some weight because I have not been working out. But Max, you're a guy that works out all the time. I mean, I have you on Instagram. I see you're posting beach beach videos and stuff, and I'm like, okay, Max, pretty jacked. Um, so we said as a, as a show, we wanted to do kind of a fitness challenge in, uh, going into 2023. Wouldn't it be so mm -hmm. cool? Yeah. To like yeah. get people on board to look, you, this is your like vehicle, right? That you go through life with this mm -hmm. meat wagon right here. This is what we get. And like, you have to take care of it. You have to, um, mm -hmm. there's a really cool documentary mm -hmm. on Netflix right now called Stutz. It's like, oh, I, I saw yeah, it. I haven't watched Jonah it all Hill yet. But... And his um, 
therapist basically mm -hmm. we made a documentary together mm. and the therapist talks about like uh for most people if they just exercise and change what they eat that that's like 85 percent of the progress towards getting rid of like depression and anxiety which mm -hmm. is unbelievable it's like mind-blowing mm -hmm. and jonah talks about how like um for him when he was younger and he was overweight that like being told to work out or to diet was like a thing that you did because you were not a certain way. You needed to do that so you could look a certain way or be different mm. or because you didn't look great. But it, it has nothing to do with that. Like it's a bonus that if you work out really hard and eat right, you look better. But the real reason is like your, your energy and your mental health. It's the biggest contributor to like your motivation, getting rid of depression, anxiety. Like you, you have to take care of this vehicle. Like a lot of uh, people's like lack of motivation and drive is their lack of movement in their life. Like you have to move your body. Uh, so it's cool to like work out and want to get in shape and lose weight. But like the most important thing is to get moving into your life. It's like for your brain health, like both your actual brain and, and like your mental health, um, movement's super important. So yeah, let's get magicians working out. Like, wow, that'd be a cool mm -hmm. challenge. How do we do it? That's we it. Do yeah. That's we want to do it. We want to do yeah. a fitness challenge for magicians. Sweet. All that's access great. is the, yeah, we got to come up with it. That's, that's the new, uh, that's our new plan though. For 2023, we said new year's resolution. Let's get magicians in shape. Look, because no, you yeah, have more I, energy yeah. to do all of the things that you want to do in your life, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, my metric when I was in my twenties was like looking better. Like that was, it was like a selfish ego based reason to want to work out. But like now in my thirties, I realize like the real value of it is your energy. Like mm -hmm. how you feel is everything, right? Like having energy to do the things that you want to do in a day to show up for like people and conversations and be present and have great energy and have a clear head and, you know, and if you're ambitious as well, like having a body that can carry you to the finish line of like these big projects you want to do, um, is, it's like everything. So, mm. yeah. Yeah. The mental clarity and the lack of anxiety and things is a and huge travel is a big yeah. part of being a magician, right? Like if you mm. want to do this for a living and travel is really draining and exhausting. So like mm -hmm. taking care of your body and being aware of what you eat, like that will allow it to be more sustainable. Yeah. Uh, I, I explain that to people all the time is like, because a lot of times, Sue, we finish shows, it's like 11 o'clock at night and like, mm -hmm. what's open? Uh, McDonald's, right? And it's like, oh, so I have to eat don't shit eat. or, I, I yeah, like, or don't, don't eat. eat. Is the, That's it. It's, it's like getting. It's pushing your brain. Past not, that. Yeah. Making the choice. Like when I fly most of the time, I just don't, I just don't eat. Like for mm -hmm. that, you cannot eat for four or five hours, like until you get where you're going and you can get something. Uh, yeah. But also just do the best you can. Like. You do good mm -hmm. when you're at home so that when you're traveling, you don't have to be so strict, right? Because mm -hmm. yeah. like, mm -hmm. that's the thing you were talking about was like, I used to be so strict with my diet that if I ate anything outside of it, I would get sick because mm -hmm. I had like no um, resolution, I guess. It was yeah. just like, I had to stick to it. So like, oh. yeah, being, being, healing your gut so that you can, but also that's like the whole point of life too, is like joy. You should enjoy your life mm -hmm. too, right? Mm -hmm. You should, I eat pizza, I eat ice cream, I go out and like I go on vacation, eat whatever the hell I want. Cause like food equals joy, right? Like joy has value in life. Mm -hmm. um, but 99% of the time I'm home, I try to make smart choices, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So for this challenge, I mean, I'm someone that is a big believer in, in daily consistency. You know, I, mm -hmm. I find that if I, if I start taking days off or if I do the kind of thing of like overtraining one day, so I need rest days, then I find that it doesn't promote the same kind of benefits that I get. If I just am consistent on a daily basis of, of exercising, you know, when I feel that if I, if I have a rest day, then I don't get the mental clarity benefits that I have on a day that I work out, you know? So I'm more about not killing myself on one day of the week so that I need rest days more just like being able to do it every, you know, seven days a week. And I wonder if it would be good for us to, for this challenge, promote something that is, you know, a lighter uh, kind of regimen or. Yeah. <laughs> I saw something on Twitter today. I think it was like this guy, Sahil Bloom, I think is his name. I might be getting the last name wrong, but he talks about like behavior hacks all the time. And his thing was 30 for 30. So 30 mm -hmm. minutes a day for 30 days mm -hmm. is like so attainable. Like you can do 30 minutes of something right? Of yep. anything. Mm -hmm. And it's like enough of an amount of time to actually see change, right? Mm -hmm. It's not so little that you won't see any change in 30 days. It's like a significant enough portion of time, but it's not too much time that you're going to find it hard to do for 30 days. So like, imagine mm -hmm. if you did anything, imagine if you spent 30 minutes 
a, a day for 30 days editing. Like think mm -hmm. about how much progress you would make learning how to be like a better video editor with 900 minutes of practice editing. 900, mm -hmm. 9,000, nine, yeah, 900. 900, yeah. yeah. Minutes yeah. Uh, or whatever it is. Or like 30, if you don't do cardistry and you want to do that 30 minutes a day for 30 days, think about how much progress you would make in 900 mm -hmm. minutes of, of cardistry or whatever it is. So yeah. I think 30 for 30 could be really cool for fitness. It's just like yeah. movement. Just like, and it's wherever you're at. It's mm -hmm. wherever you're at in your life right now. If you don't have any form of movement in your life, then just go for a walk, like with your dog or your girlfriend or whatever, you know, um, for 30 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah any yeah, kind absolutely. of movement. Ride a bike, you know, just, yeah, 30 for 30 would be really cool. I like it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Grant saying fun, exciting, challenging. Yeah, uh, we're going to get on it. <laughs> always enjoy the 30 day challenges. Yeah. yeah. So we'll put a pro, we'll put something together. Yeah. And uh, I want to do, I want to do part of the challenge that is universal for everyone. Just like be on it. And if you, and the only way to lose is to just give up and to not, not continue. But I also yeah. want there to be a competitive element between Ryan and I, where one of us can come out on top and beat the other one. There has mm. to be. <laughs> Max, <laughs> why he wants to do this is because that well, one of you wants life. to lose weight and the other one wants to gain weight. So I, how do you, Oh, I, I'm you, always going to yeah, be pushing the weights heavy. Effort. So yeah, as long as at the, the end, heavy, yeah. I'm still bigger than, uh, than blaze, then it's okay. Uh, dude, I'm going to get huge. dude. <laughs> uh, he's just upset max. Cause while we were at magic live, the last day we did uh, a lasagna eating contest oh. and, uh, where's my invite? We had, we had vegan lasagna there. Uh, and, uh, I destroyed him. It wasn't can this, close. Can this be the official call for like the all access magic crew to come to magic live? It's so epic. Yeah. It's yeah. Such oh, yeah. a fun convention. Like, oh, totally. yeah. I don't yeah. even see the convention because the hanging out is so it's the mm -hmm. best hanging out at a convention of any convention. Like totally 24 hours mm -hmm. a day. There will be people like in the lobby of the casino hanging out, sharing magic. It's just really cool vibes. Like it's such a good conference. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. that's where that's yeah. where we met. Was yeah, uh, was Magic I, Live? It was just like just oh, from hey. like a social standpoint, it's so much fun. You'll see yeah, all your yeah. friends from the internet. It's people are so welcoming. It's really inviting. There's not really a lot of egos. It's it's a really mm -hmm. good time. That yeah. that was the best part for me. I mean, Fiddle and Johnny. Uh, we met <laughs> Fiddle and Johnny there. Johnny came up to me and was like, "Hey, man, I'm a huge fan of yours. Uh, I'm about to blow your mind because you don't know who I am." <laughs> Like, I have no idea who this guy is. And then all of a sudden, he's like, I'm Johnny. I was like, <laughs> like it's like, we see like, you every week, Johnny. It's like we have yeah. like a personal relationship with everybody that watches, and it's pretty awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, we definitely need to do a big Magic Live meetup uh, in the future. We also really need to make that Lilydale thing happen. Now that you're doing your show, what a great mm -hmm. promotion for your show, Psychic, if yeah. we were to go to Lilydale and do content there. Mm -hmm. I know. I actually am signing up for a class at Lilydale. Uh, you oh, can take really? a, uh, a class online virtually uh, starting in March. So oh. I uh, said to myself and my uh, producer and stuff that uh, oh, let's take this class. Let's <laughs> let's see what we can learn. So no. now we've out. already teased purple a little bit. We did so tease purple a little bit. It I might, it might be good for us to hit, hit him yeah. now. We're going to do it a little bit different this time. We'll do it in a way where we can all oh, yeah. see our reactions. So Yeah, sounds good. I like okay. it. Okay, here we go. I don't know if he's ready, but... Uh, I don't know, I don't know what's ready. going on right now. Yeah, it's about to blow his oh. mind. All right, I'm ready. All right, here we go. Oh, we can barely hear it, though. You can't hear it? No, you can't like, hear barely. It? Uh, lasagna. Barely. We need it. We need it. What you gotta pump is that? How you spell is I need to pump it. Okay, you know, it yes, it, yes, it is. We've already gone through this debate. Uh, we're gonna <laughs> okay, I'll I just swear, do it the original traditional the way. We need to me. bump this shit. Here we go. Three, <laughs> two, one. Lasagna, lasagna. What's your favorite genre of lasagna? Meat, lasagna, veggie, lasagna, plain. Lasagna. Saucy. Lasagna. What's your favorite genre of lasagna? Keller. Lasagna. Cheese. Lasagna. Bolognese. Lasagna. Lasagna. Blame. Houdini. What's yours? 
Oof. I like day old lasagna. Oh. Day old. Yeah, because uh. it, you know, it like firms up and then you reheat it and it's just, it's like perfect the second day. Well, you're you a know, cloud, we uh... have a proclivity. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> We had one other person say that uh, that answer <laughs> a while back uh, when we had Colin Cloud on the show. He was like, "I like day old, yeah, yeah, microwave lasagna." Uh, yeah. Had to be I eat it cold food. too, but I eat a lot of food cold. I'm weird like that. I don't mm. eat things, but next day is better. Day old, day microwave old lasagna. lasagna. No, I was just gonna say that it seems like there's a proclivity for mentalists to, uh, it's to true. like <laughs> just reheated yeah. lasagna. Just, just eat cold shit the next day. <laughs> Dude, I, I don't know. Now I hear cold lasagna and I'm just traumatized thinking about sorbet. Oh, it's, yeah. So, yeah, it's really so bad. Max, the, the the thing was when I beat uh, Blaze uh, at the lasagna contest, at, not beat, destroyed him at the How lasagna eating contest. How much lasagna did you eat? So it was just a, a container of lasagna. So it was like one, like two big Like a pieces. family platter? No, 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 no. Like a single, like a personal. No, it was more. It was more a speed competition, not a volume. Oh, it was a yeah, race, yeah. not a quantity. It right. was a race, yeah. a quantity. I would have destroyed the, the him anyways as well. Wow. But uh, and the thing but... is, I was going so fast off the bat, and then I could not, I could not keep going. It was just it he's... like it all solidified, and I could not swallow any of it. It was just yeah. so difficult. He's never watched competitive eating, so mm -hmm. he took one huge mouthful. Uh, and Ricardo Bernini, he was the uh, uh, he was the judge because uh, the Italian guy, right? Uh, and uh, <laughs> he's and like, oh so, no, it is a lasagna. <laughs> he's 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 like Ryan, you're getting killed. You're getting killed. Blaze is so far ahead. I I'm sitting there. I'm cutting mine up like no problem, and then just went to town and. Uh, it was done. He wasn't even halfway done. Maybe we <laughs> have a all access magic meetup lasagna party. Mm -hmm. that's it that's it that's what we were trying to do last year but uh but it ended up there was only a couple of people that that were able to make it to magic live and stuff mm -hmm. so but uh but we want to do it for sure yeah, um absolutely. but i want to do a full-on party this time yeah his his uh i guess <clears throat> We have it vlogged. Regrets. His yeah. regret of losing was then he had to go uh, up to the Baskin Robbins there and ask for sorbet into his lasagna and eat it that way. Uh, so, was, And that was already just a funny moment of just giving her a big plate of lasagna and being like, can you just put the ice cream right here? Yeah. <laughs> so he had to mix it in and eat it. And yeah, it's pretty gross. Dude, the, dude, I'm still traumatized by that image of the spinach that was like... <laughs> Or whatever green. green that was in the middle of my sorbet, dude. Yeah, yeah. that was my uh, trendsetter. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's yeah, a, definitely a new genre. I I, uh, I wish that I was more up on the uh, the visualization then. I wish that I could have been mind over matter. Just told myself that it was <laughs> something first. else other than this concoction, because that was some Frankenstein lasagna right there. No hot sorbet and cold lasagna. That's mm -hmm. it. He's an absolute yeah. savage. Just, yeah, yeah, savage. Just, exactly. just, dude, I'm savage. I don't bro. think Goggins could do that. This is how we get those gains, man. Uh, so we have a follow up question mm -hmm. about the lasagna, though. Uh, okay. So, Max, if you baked, uh, I guess not even baked, if you microwaved day old lasagna and then you baked, or then you microwaved an identical slice of day old microwave lasagna mm -hmm. and blaze, and then you take said second microwave lasagna and stack it atop the first microwave lasagna okay. how many lasagna do you have now just one one or just two one. no if it's in a stack it's, it's always one yeah oh, that oh i love the confidence yeah because there's no limit to layers in lasagna so the is that true you put one lasagna on top of the other lasagna you have a lasagna all right this so is what we're saying man and it's so lasagna. is this a yeah is this a full-fledged endorsement of the lasagna mathematics hoodie available at allaccessmagic.com? Oh my gosh, it's a thing. Nice job. <laughs> one plus one does equal one. This equals one. The comfiest hoodie. You can just be just like Fiddlin' Johnny with your lasagna hoodie. Um, lasagna mathematics, one plus one equals one. If you go to allaccessmagic.com slash shop, we also have what's your favorite genre of lasagna, uh, t-shirts and t hoodies. Yeah. Yeah, because lasagna is plural and singular too, right? Like, there's no lasagnas. It's just lasagna would be like yeah, yeah lasagna. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. What we did find out is you were asking about the e and the uh, 
thinking that it was, should be an A, um, <clears throat> we did find out that one layer of lasagna, like the noodle, is spelt with the E, mm -hmm. and then the full lasagna is spelt with the A. Yeah. 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 Yeah, dude. Yeah. The noodles. The noodles. Well, I got my oh, new yeah. opener for my stage show right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you know? Did you talk know? about that in your therapy sessions? <laughs> just just uh, blowing up everybody's oh mind. Gosh. That's that's really <laughs> eye-opening. You see, this is where we ask the hard hitting questions here mm. yeah. at Alex's Magic. I wasn't aware we were still live. I thought we were just hanging out and talking. Uh, <laughs> we're People just... watching this? <laughs> Oh, I thought it was. I thought it ended, and we were just hanging out. <laughs> Slowly goes down. <laughs> Slowly goes downhill. Uh, that's so, awesome. Uh, so, what was your experience like overall being on AGT? <laughs> oh, no Bring it back like, to a serious just, note. Just raw dog that transition. Yeah, was, like, yeah, yeah, dude, that's absolute raw dog on that transition, man. <laughs> <laughs> Hit it hard. Speaking of lasagna. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was the uh, craft of lasagna? Like? You know, I mean, table? there's a lot of different layers, maybe rounds, you might say, <laughs> in this competition yes. show. Yeah. Uh, what was the question? What was my overall experience? Yeah. I think it was this at that time because I not. Yeah, at that time it was the most fun experience of my life. Mm. At that awesome. moment, yeah. like up until that <laughs> point in my life. Uh, yes. Yeah, it was just an absolute blast. That that's mm. the. Like anyone who was considering doing the show and hesitating, just do it. Like it's so mm. much fun. That's mm. the, you know, if you don't get past the auditions, no one sees it anyway. So it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Right. But if you do end up going on, I think there's this preconception that like, oh, I could be portrayed badly or they're not in the business of making acts look bad. That's, that's not the business they're in. Mm -hmm. Like they're in the business of making you look as good as possible. Like. Mm. that's they love magic specifically too they really love magicians and mentalists so their goal isn't to make anyone look silly or to sabotage acts it's literally you will have a team a really talented team with unlimited resources around you to create whatever you want it's like any set idea you have in your head w whatever it is um i mean you still have to come with the ideas but they'll they'll help you pull things off and they'll make it look beautiful the music will be perfect you know, the, the bio story packages they put together. I mean, they're like the best in the business that with those like 30 second, here's everything you need to know about blaze. And, mm. um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's really fun. And I had like complete and total, like creative autonomy. No one told me what to do or what to say. Now they would give you feedback. Like, you know, you, maybe you want to word this differently or something like that, but they, they ultimately would say it's your decision. You know, mm. it's, it's up to you. What do you want to do? Um, so mm. I think like, depending where you are in your career, they may or may not hold your hand more than others, right? Like I came in with a really clear vision for like who I was and how I performed on stage and what I wanted to communicate. And uh, they did everything they could to help me make that a reality. So yeah, it and it's just a rush. I mean, it's still, I think, like one of the biggest live broadcasts in the world. So mm -hmm. like there's an entirely different experience between like performing something that's going to be recorded and then edited and then broadcast later. And like knowing that like right now I'm looking at this camera and there are, I'm going to make up a number, 14 million people watching at this exact moment, whatever mm -hmm. I say. Um, and that's really exciting. Like that's a huge rush. Um, and you can, you know, um, kind of do whatever you want with it afterwards. Like, you know, it's, it's like whatever you make of it like mm -hmm. after the show how you retell the story and mm -hmm. and then you have those clips for the rest of your life you're like i mean there are acts that were on that show 10 years ago that are still the act from agt because mm -hmm. as far as pop culture yeah. is concerned as long as the show is still airing it doesn't matter what season you were on so yeah. that's like a feather in your cap and a clip in your reel and a note on your website and for the rest of your life um you know until until nobody cares about that show anymore but right now people still care about it but it'll look amazing uh, you'll have a great time. And I had a totally positive experience. Anything negative I ever heard about AGT before doing it was always from people who weren't actually on the show. Mm. Everyone I've talked to that did it themselves had a good outcome, like had a good experience. Mm. It's mm -hmm. only people who are like, oh, I heard they'll X, Y, or Z. And and I am guilty as well. Like I turned it down for years. Like I, and I had all the same stories because it's just stories. 
that I told myself of why not to do it. So instead of like taking this amazing opportunity that was right in front of me, I came up with all the reasons not to do it. Oh, they'll make me look bad. Oh, what if it doesn't go well? What if I fail on live TV? What if they portray me and make me look stupid? Or I'm not in control of how they're going to make me look. And I came up with all these reasons not to do it, you know, mm -hmm. um, until eventually I, you know, was at a point in my life where I was sort of just saying yes to whatever came my way. And AGT happened to, to happen at that same time. So, mm. um, yeah, like, don't come up with reasons not to do it. Like, it's really fun. Mm. It's good to hear. Yeah. And it's a great, it's a great opportunity. I mean, if you make it a couple rounds, at least, um, it's a lot of exposure and a lot of press and, um, people get uh, like visibly excited for your performances in real life. Like they, they will go and research you before that, you know, they hear you're performing at a conference or a local event or something and they'll look you up and then they see you on AGT and they get really excited. Like it, it changes the dynamic of the people that are in the audience for your shows having been on that show. Like they mm. convince themselves that they're seeing something really special. Um, and it is still really special to, to get on that show and to, um, to, to go a long way. It's yeah. still means something. Yeah. Nice. Um, Fiddle and Johnny said, did you work with a team, um, for that? Uh, or did you have a team that helped you? And then, uh, um, to, yes, if you had a consultant or was it just so you? I like, always bounce ideas off my friends like that's how i operate and like my main collaborator on that was a director that i've worked with for years named chad rabinovitz he's based out mm. of uh indiana he works for like a theater there mm. so he's just like my go-to brainstorming buddy but i didn't like assemble a formal team of consultants like i know some people do i i don't think that's a bad idea i, I think it actually limited my creativity to just like be in a bubble with you know, the ideas that I had in my own head. I, th I think like collaboration is like a really important tool. I think there's this fallacy that like creativity is this solo endeavor and it's this thing that some people have and some people don't. And, and you like picture this person like toiling away in privacy and then they like emerge with their big idea. But I, but I think that like most great works of creativity are a result of collaboration and not isolation. Mm -hmm. And so I think like involving other people in the conversation, whether that's like formally hiring a consultant like a Danny Garcia or a Kaylin Morelli or, um, you know, whoever to, to work on something that's a TV performance, or it's just having your circle of friends that you like trust that you bounce ideas off of because it's like someone, your idea will become more once you like get it out and, and in conversation and it will inspire a thought in someone else. And then you know, it, it bounces back and forth that way and it, it, it grows and it becomes something else, you know? Um, so yeah, like collaboration is only something that I've unlocked for myself in the last few years. I've like realized, I thought you were like supposed to do it alone. Like, mm -hmm. oh yeah. you. But, you know, look at David Blaine's latest like stage show. Um, he posted like very publicly about all the brilliant minds that worked on that. Um, Kaylin Morelli, uh, Nate Staniforth, um, um, who's the app guy, Mark, um, oh, Mark, Mark Kirstein, Kirstein. Mark yeah. Kirstein, um, you know, super talented, lots of, lots of really creative minds solving problems, right? Like you can have these mm -hmm. people vision and go, well, how do we do this? How do we pull this off? How do we make this more interesting? So, yeah, I definitely like encourage everyone watching to like form a group of like friends that you trust and also like throw your ideas off of like non magicians. That's really fun too, because mm. they'll have ideas that aren't constrained by um, like methods because they don't have to worry about how it's done. They can just get creative. And a lot of like really fun brainstorming sessions I've had have been with like my friends who are filmmakers or my friends who work in traditional theater and they're not constrained by like magic thinking. And so they can just have a crazy idea for a plot. Like, wouldn't it be mm. cool if you mm -hmm. did this, right? Um, but then also having your your magic buddies that you trust that you bounce ideas off of and not being afraid to like share ideas out in the open. Like, you know, don't like hold things so sacred that you're afraid if you like say it out loud, someone's going to steal it. Uh, obviously, like you can form a circle that you trust. But also, I think like don't discount the effort it takes to actually steal an idea. Like mm -hmm. most people are not going to do the work. So even speaking something out loud, like it requires a tremendous, the idea is only half of it. Like execution is so big. So like, you know, you got to go out and actually make the thing as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think, 
um, if I were to do AGT again, I would probably involve more people in uh, the creative process for sure mm. than I did. But it's, it's funny when I was interviewing Tom last week, he said the exact same thing with like when he started, um, it was like, you got to do this by yourself, right? You got to create every show by yourself. You got to do everything. And like, then it's you against every other magician in the world kind of and like, here's my thing. Right. Um, he, he lives down the street from Dan white. Uh, and so Dan is like, Oh, you know, no, no, no. You need a team of people like to make it the absolute best. And so it's interesting though, that when I think most of us, when we start, like, I think my first three big like theater shows, I was like, I did everything myself, like scripting every like, and I was like, after a while, I was like, oh, you know what? I'm okay at this, but there's yeah. probably people that are better than me at this. So why not bring them on and, well, and only also, make my stuff better? It's not just about people who are better at something. It's about different perspectives. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that's like a really important piece of it. It's just like different life experiences, different perspectives, different voices, different taste. Um, yeah, I think that's a really big piece of it. Um, there's a great book called Steal Like an Artist that I think mm. every magician should read. Um, it's really about this. It's about like the nature of creativity and where ideas come from and the idea that like everything is inspired by what came before it. Um, such an incredible book, Steal Like an Artist. Yeah. So mm. It's like perfectly aligned with this conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, another. Oh, well, we'll check and see as well if it's an audio book, but there you go. Another yeah, probably is another it's an book easy read too, though. In uh, physical, um, it's pretty short. So, here is a question because I, uh, I've consulted a couple times on AGT, and so here, and I, I loved it, it was great being in, in LA and stuff and, and doing the work there. But, um, <clears throat> a lot of people go on with like one act in mind. Uh, okay. They're like, okay, yeah, this kind of goes in with Fiddle and Johnny's I question. Yeah. question. Yeah. He yeah. says, uh, when mm. you started on the show, did you have a plan for each effect you would be doing all the okay. way to the end, or did you decide week from week? So, I prior to doing the show, I asked this question to friends who had done the show. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I heard both, I heard some people who planned every act ahead of time, and then I heard other people who didn't know what they were going to do, like each round. And I think the best advice that I got for AGT prior to doing it was from uh, Oz Perlman. And Oz said, nothing is guaranteed past each round. And mm -hmm. so at every moment, you should be doing the strongest possible thing you have. In other words, like you can't save anything for the semis or the finals because you don't even know if you're going to make it that far. Mm -hmm. And so at every moment, you have to literally do the strongest thing you have at that moment. And I, I think that was like the best advice uh, he possibly could have given me. And so I had some loose ideas of what I wanted to do, but it happened really fast. Um, my experience was probably different than a lot of people because I didn't plan to go on the show. It was like mm. during the government shutdown and they had to stop filming. You were like the first season during the shutdown, right? Yeah, I, it was yeah. like the only virtual season. They had mm. an audience for every season, but mm. the season I was on. And so they were kind of scrambling and looking for acts rather than acts coming to them. And they reached out because I was doing a virtual show at the time. And they were like, could you perform for a virtual audience? We're not going to have an audience this season. But it happened very fast. And I was of the mind that like when the shutdown started, that I didn't know what was going to happen in my life, but that I was going to be open to whatever came next because there was so much uncertainty. And so I was going to be in a state of surrender to like, yeah, I'm going to say yes to whatever life offers. And they called when I was in that mindset. So, um, you know, the first round, I did something really basic, but I knew that it was enough that it would be good enough to get their attention. Like on the short, I had literally like two days notice to do it. Mm, and then wow. each round, I always felt like I was scrambling. Like you would get off stage in one round and it would go really well. And you'd be like, oh my gosh. And then literally a producer would meet you in the wings and be like, okay, what are you doing next week? Mm -hmm. And you're like, I don't, I don't know. I just literally, what? I just did the best thing I could ever come up with. Mm. We need to know right now and they're like yeah we need to know right now um, yeah and so i felt like every round after the auditions every round i felt like i had no more ideas i was like wow that was like the best idea i had i really felt that way after the one where i had everybody at home draw a picture and everyone uh was mm. like influenced to draw the same picture i that was like a vision i had for a routine for 
doing on television for like 10 years mm. and I never did it. And uh, when it when I found out it was a virtual season, I was like, oh, this is why I never did it, because it was waiting for this moment. It's such mm. a better effect when people are at home mm. instead of in the studio, instead of in the audience, because it's like, how could you possibly have influenced mm. them all over the world? All these anonymous people on the screen. Mm. Um, so like after that, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know. But every time every I had that thought, you know, I would just like sit and breathe in the moment of like, OK, we just pulled that off. And then I would show up the next day to like with a clean slate and just an idea would come in and I would just trust my instincts and uh, kind of go with that. So so I don't know if I'm the best example because I was really kind of like I had ideas of things that have been floating in my head for years, but I didn't go into AGT planning every round. Um, it really came together. Like, I think like the shortest turnaround I had was like seven days or something from one round to the next, but it's less time than that because you have to be rehearsing it on stage like two days later. So mm -hmm. really, you know, it was like two days to come up with and script and do the whole thing. But that pace was part of why I said it was so fun was that yeah. pace is really exciting. Like yeah. that extra level of pressure forces you so far outside of your comfort zone and it forces you to unlock like a new level of creativity it really taught me the value of rehearsal because i i'd never like rehearsed really hard in my life before that mm. like for that show i i almost over rehearsed like i had every word kind of planned and every beat um so it teaches you a whole bunch of new skills um, but then i talked to jonathan goodwin who was on that season with me and jonathan had a plan for every round he, he knew exactly how it would escalate and how it would get bigger and what he would be doing in the finals um which he ended up doing on agt extreme which uh, unfortunately, he oh, got yeah. really badly injured, but I, yeah. I believe that was going to be his finale for for the regular AGT. Um, um, he's he's an epic, epic human being, very inspiring, um, mm -hmm. beautiful, beautiful guy. Uh, but he he went in kind of knowing what every stage was going to be. And I felt like I had to top myself each round because I didn't do that work. Yeah. Um, but but again, it's just like you just play the hand you're dealt. I didn't plan to be on the show and then it fell on my lap and I was like, we're doing this. You know, I'm not going to come up with reasons not to like I had. in the yeah. past. So, so there's no rules, but I do think Oz's advice is the best, which is don't save anything for later. So mm -hmm. if you have ideas for like the rounds, the best one should be first because it's like, that's all that's guaranteed. Mm -hmm. and you should create a problem for yourself, which is like that act was so good. You're like, I have no idea how I'm going to top that. Like that's a really high quality problem. Is that you do yeah. something that's so good that you yourself don't know how you'll beat it? Um, mm. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's good to like. I mean, being a mentalist, it's good. Like you went in, did your first thing, and then come up with different things. Uh, when I worked with uh, Brundage uh, when he was on the show, uh, he went in the first week, doesn't you know his his Rubik's cube routine, and then is like, okay, I have no more Rubik's oh, cube got. tricks. Yeah, that's it. It's a 10 minute act. Yeah. And they, well, it was know, also they his greatest hits, right? Like those yeah. were his yeah. like banger effects that he had been doing yeah. for I don't know how long. So he, he called me and was like, can you come up with a bunch but, of Rubik's like, Cube that stuff? And, like, epic audition can be the oh, video that goes around the world, the most viral that then sets your career on fire. And maybe the two or three things you did next weren't better than that. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, you rocked the world. Like, look yeah. at you know how much success piff has had from a single mm -hmm. performance on penn and teller fool us you know yeah, yeah. Such, the, yeah that audition teller, but like, such so, an epic performance yeah. that it like you know got the world's attention so i remember penn saying that that piff is the ultimate winner of fool us like no mm -hmm. one else has done anything in comparison if you're ever in piff. vegas you have to see his show it's i oh, it's great. It's haven't great. seen it in a about a year but I, at the last time I saw it, it was my favorite magic show in Vegas. It's mm -hmm. so much fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, it's ridiculous. I, I wish I saw it during the pandemic because I, I know they added a lot of stuff about like social distancing and stuff like that, which I heard was just stupid funny. But mm -hmm. uh, I saw it previous to that. But it was amazing, an absolutely amazing show. Uh, mm. But yeah, uh, I guess to close the AGT thing, if you're thinking about doing it, do it. Yeah. And you can always yeah. go back. Like if you like audition and you because I saw someone in the chat said, I feel like I'm not ready. I think I don't remember who that was. Just try. And if you don't make it past the audition, you can always audition again later. I auditioned for AGT the first time when I was like 17, I think. Mm. And I went on and then I didn't hear anything back. I just went to like big cattle call thing 
And then I didn't go on the show until I was 37. 20. Wow. Well, I don't know if that math adds up because there's like 15 seasons. Yeah. So I was somewhere between like 17 and 22. I don't, I don't know. Mm. Um, but I remember being like old enough to drive and going up to New York and auditioning. And I, I don't, I think, I don't even, I think I did a newspaper tear with like the classic mm. pattern of like, it looks like I'm tearing it, but I'm not really tearing it. It's all just an illusion. Even though it sounds real, it's not real. And then boom, it's back together. Mm, and they were like, nice. hey, thank you. We'll let you know. I was like, all right, I killed it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I crushed that, man. <laughs> That's amazing. No, I, had the, I had a very similar experience because I did audition a long time ago and I was when I was like 16 or whatever. And uh, and yeah. I did something. And then they called me back into the room and I... I think I messed up <laughs> when they called me back into the room. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause I just like, wasn't prepared to do a second audition right there. Yeah. I was like, Oh, okay. It, yeah. I got to like do something different. Ready, All right, yeah. that's, that's okay. You'll find out because you yeah. won't get on the show. Yeah. In other words, yeah. if you're ready, you'll get on the show. So you don't have to, you don't have to decide if you're ready or not, just go do it. Mm -hmm. And then they'll decide for you, mm -hmm. you know, assuming like you care about what you're doing and you're competent and you like rehearse it and you have a, you're not going to look dumb. You know, if you yeah. showed up and did no work, you might be in the montage of like mm -hmm. acts that don't go well, but you know, uh, that's worked for some people like Jack Grady, my favorite social media magician. I don't know. Mm -hmm. if you're Jack oh yeah. That no, I'm just going to yeah. say it out loud. Jack, Jack Grady's the greatest magician on social media right now. Um, he went on AGT to fail. Like yeah. that was, his whole thing was he was going to do the bottle in the ass trick on AGT and like make a meme out of being the meme of AGT. Uh, <laughs> so absolutely brilliantly played. So, you know, even failure can be, I think his like tagline is the fastest buzzer in the history of AGT or something like that. So, <laughs> That's epic. awesome. It's just awesome. great. Yeah. It's like, if you go in with a plan and you really visualize it, then, you know, you can make it happen, you know? And it's like what you were talking before with, you know, if you, if you really visualize something and see clearly what your objective is, then you can, you can absolutely ask for it and make it happen. Um, I think I was, I keep seeing in my feed right now, which has been part of the getting back into fitness motivation. Cause we're on the week of the Olympia coming up and I see mm -hmm. all of Chris Bumstead. Uh, oh, and he's yeah. like, I, he's like, I'm dead right now. He's like, I'm just like, you know, in so much pain <laughs> because it's Actually, peak week. I'm just water depleted, but he's like, I still go on the, on the treadmill, no headphones. And I just visualize what I'm going to be like on stage or like Conor McGregor when he uh, knocked out Jose Aldo, there's videos of him shadow boxing. And it's the exact same 13 second sequence that then happened in the octagon when he knocked him out in 13 seconds. And it's like, if you see yeah. it in your mind, you'll hold it in your hand. Yeah. yeah. So I do um, some private coaching for a lot of professional athletes, uh, including UFC fighter, big wave surfer, some really big personalities in the sports. Mm. Uh, and it's like all mental. It's like the conversation you have with yourself. Think about fighting, for example, like, at the highest level, like we're talking like a championship fight in the UFC, right? They're both like peak nutrition, peak health, peak fitness. They're all in on the training. Their physical bodies are ready. Their, you know, their skill sets are probably pretty evenly matched. They have the same length arms. There's like very little separating them. And so what separates the guy that wins from the guy that loses is what's going on right here, right? And if you're focused on losing or how bad it would be to lose the title, what do you think's going to happen when you get in the ring? You're going to lose the title, right? <clears throat> yeah. Um, you know, or if you hold an idea like I'm not worthy or something like that. Um, so, so yeah, it's like the same thing with your performances as a magician is like taking a moment before you step on stage to turn your performance over to the part of yourself that knows what to do. Because mm. there's no more preparation anymore. Like they're about to say your name on stage you are as prepared as you're going to be. You can't like think through it anymore. There's no benefit to thinking through the performance, right? And if you've done the work, which hopefully you've done the work, then you can just turn that performance over to the part of you that, that, that knows what to do. And you can just step into a flow state on stage and just let the performance come through you, like assuming you've mm -hmm. done the reps. Um, I have an exercise that I've done before walking on stage for like, uh, I don't know, maybe 20 years um but before every show 
standing in the wings. I say a prayer to myself. It's not a religious prayer. It's just a thing that I say. And I close my eyes. I don't say it out loud. But in my head, I say with all of my being, with all of my intent, I mean it. And if I'm not there for every word of it, I'll say it again. Like it, it's my only focus. And I say, this is a prayer to my higher self. Don't let me down. And I open my eyes and I walk on stage. And mm. I'm turning over what I'm about to do to the part of me that knows exactly what to do. Right? My higher self. There's nothing to do. Mm. There's nothing to think about. Just, just go be. Just mm. step on stage and just be present. Um, and I've shared that with some friends of mine who are DJs or, you know, any other, any other artists. And it's just like, it's, I think it's a really helpful thing to do to get yourself out of your own head and just step into the present moment of that show. Again, mm -hmm. assuming you've done the work, no there's right. like no excuse for not being prepared, meaning like mm -hmm. not rehearsing properly, not being organized, not knowing where your props are. I'm taking all of that for granted that you've done that like baseline level of effort, right? And then at that point, you just step on stage at whatever level you're at, at that moment in your life, in your progression, and uh, give them all you got. That's it. Mm. I think that's a great that's that, piece of advice to end it on. That is. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Max, that's, you've been... That's our final nugget of the night. Hey, brr, brr, brr. I think, I think brr, like brr. I said, I, I think you set the record. We probably could have added 10 more throughout this whole episode. <laughs> uh, but Max, you're an incredible guy, incredible entertainer. Uh, I keep smashing it. Uh, I mean, you're killing it on everything. Every time I see you doing something else, I'm like, oh, yeah, here it goes. He's going to kill this. Look, so. for anyone, <clears throat> I don't know what your goal is to be a full time performer, to create products for magicians, to lecture around the world, to have a huge review show. or I don't know what your goal is, but whatever it is that you're thinking about doing, like there's absolutely nothing preventing you from doing it. There's nothing standing in your way. You can do it right. If I can do it, you can. Why not you? Anybody can do this. It's not complicated. Um, it just has to be something that that you want. You know, you want to be a full time performer. A lot of people have done it. It's it's not complicated. You don't even have to be famous to earn a living doing magic, mm -hmm. right? And you can have a life that is so rich and so much fun. And uh, why not you? I'm not special. You guys aren't special. Well, we're all special. That's actually the irony in it, right? Is that none of us are special, but we're all special. I mean, we're. Mm so lucky to be here so yeah go make it go create it i love it i love it uh max one last question only because i know it's come up a few times what's your jacket made of that's mm. what people want to know mm. they, they're saying you look like it's, uh, it's a wolverine and... that i slayed myself no, uh, <laughs> he says max looks like he's turning <laughs> he's in the middle of turning into a werewolf yeah it's, i it's, love it it's faux fur nice nice yeah. awesome well thank you so much again max uh ladies right. and gentlemen everybody watching if uh i don't know what it's made yeah. of it's not real <laughs> it's not real it's I not real you. don't worry folks yeah. uh he hunted it himself. it's real wolverine man it's just straight yeah. up yeah is a wolverine an animal we're gonna okay we can it is a real animal yeah yeah it is a real they're actually crazy vicious because they're small but they can kill bears like they're they're intense okay what's well, made out of a wolverine there you go yeah there you go all right well thank you guys so much for tuning in you guys have been incredible max keep up the great work man and man inspiring inspiring tonight yeah. that's the word i gotta leave with uh but uh we'll i'm see feeling absolutely inspired thank you again for coming on uh, i feel like this was a big kick in the pants for me as well and i hope many of the people in the chat to just go out and uh, mm. and do what they've been seeing in their mind and, uh, and make it a reality so. We're now going to go take the master class backstage. Uh, so we'll see you guys later. So Thank see you. you guys. <laughs> see you next week. Peace. <laughs>